Soon, cells will be precisely programmed. Viruses can be reprogrammed. They're essentially software. Think of them as apps for your cell phone. And coding with DNA will no longer be just for expensive laboratories, but also for home use. Come check out where CRISPR kits are being made. Welcome to The Daily Wrap-Up, a concise show dedicated to bringing you the most relevant, independent news as we see it from the last 24 hours. Saturday, September 5th, 2020. Thank you for joining me today. Quite a bit to get into. I've got a really great show for you today. Probably going to be quite a bit longer or, you know, long as we're used to. And it's got to be jam-packed. So buckle in. We're going to go through a lot today. But it's a great show. There's a lot to get into. And yes, I will be talking about this thing that's been going around everywhere. I had about 13 people email me about it. And it is interesting. This is coming from the uh, the acronym is WITS. It's the website that's showing exports and imports of all kinds of different things. It's tied to the World Bank. And it's talking about COVID-19 test kits. But wait a minute, they're in 2018 and so on. And we're going to talk about that today. But it's not as important as many might think. At least that's my impression of it. And I, but yet I do think there's something interesting there nonetheless that I think people are missing in their, in the, I guess the assumption that it means what it appears to mean, which is not a bad assumption because believe me, if you see this, it seems pretty interesting. And this is just my take on why I think it might not be what it seems, but we'll get into that today for sure. But we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about something that's happening around the vaccine discussion, something more around the tests. We're going to talk some, I think one of my most, one I think the most important, if not one of the most important discussions we're going to get into today will be way at the end of the show in regard to an article that was written by Alfred Desias in regard to international law. Now, I know a lot of people, including myself, are acutely tuned into what's going on with COVID-19 because I think it's the most important thing happening to us, uh, you know, against our will at the moment, but I don't want us to forget about what's going on around the world. And there's some really important points to be made that tie in with all of this. But we're going to start today with something that is very alarming. And it really is an overarching point for the whole show today. But we're going to get into two main things to start, which, and it really does tie back to the interview I just did with Whitney Webb, which I'll show in a moment, that really gets into this idea of these tentacles of this technocratic state, this biosecurity state that is basically quietly, I mean, quietly because people aren't paying attention to it, taking control of everything. And I mean, everything. We already saw the banking system basically take BlackRock's now in control of that, right? I mean, there's a lot of different things, or excuse me, I should say the treasury and the U.S., not banking system was the wrong term there. The U.S. treasury, the Fed and the treasury are essentially being controlled by a foreign or a, a private company, let's put it that way. But we have other aspects we're seeing in regard to even housing markets, in regard to basically infrastructure in our country. We talked about the Israeli, uh, basically the project in Rhode Island that's basically creating a surveillance network for contact tracing. This goes all the way across the country we're going to talk about today. And it's very alarming. And this isn't necessarily some foreign entity. I think it's tied in with this. I think it's both of it. But at the same time, we're talking about a, a biosecurity entity that is essentially taking control of things that at one point, very recently, were at least as it appeared, broken up amongst a lot of different levers and control mechanisms. And now it seems they're just, for your safety, taking control of all of it. Which, as you've been listening to us, hopefully you've been thinking about at least the possibility that that was all the point. Now, before we get into that today, I want to start with a couple of quick notes. First of all, I wanted to say something that I think is very interesting to me. And just as a moment, take a moment to simply say, support this channel. If you are able, whether, I mean, whether you just want to send me a note, say thank you for what you're doing, which you can find that in the show notes and address or reach out with the check or PayPal or Patreon or however you want to support this channel. Most importantly, mind you, is just sharing the link, giving it to people, you know, we are 100% 
people funded. This channel is people funded. And if you've been following this channel for a long time, you know that we weren't at all, all we weren't always like that. There were times when we were working with some advertisers and had some things in the beginning like you might have seen, and I quickly came to the conclusion that that's not what I want to be. Not to disparage those that do. There's a lot of great channels that are forced to do that because you have to create a revenue stream to be able to continue to do this to compete with the monolithic but I made a choice I didn't want to do that. And I went through some really hard times because of it. And you are the reason that I'm still here. An overwhelming show of support since that moment has allowed the freedom for T-Lab to be what it is now. I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for every single one of you right there watching. And the reason I'm bringing this up, because I don't, I very rarely say that. Not, I very rarely bring up finances is the way I should put that. But the reason I am to start is because I'm even now getting things online a lot lately. People that are basically saying that because I don't ask for money, that I must be a shill. How could they possibly do this without the, mind you, meaning, meaning me in a room with my laptop? How could he possibly do all this? Me researching on my laptop. But nonetheless, how could he do all of this without being funded by somebody that we don't see? Now, sure, I, I hope you are asking those questions because you should be questioning everything. But the point is, it's a very clear train. You can see exactly where this is coming from. PayPal, Patreon, all the people that are funding this. That is why I'm here. It doesn't take much to do what I'm doing the way I've set it up, and that's why. But it's interesting to note that at one point it was, oh, look at them asking for money on YouTube. Or they must be shills because it doesn't, they're making so much money, and now it's because I'm not asking for money. You get the common thread? There are people that talk about things that they, they don't want us talking about. They'll be attacked no matter what we do. And I hope you're able to see that. But on that note, feel free and support this channel as much as you're able because that is what gives us the freedom to continue. But again, the point is really sharing the work, really what it comes down to. Now, starting off with some other points here, I wanted to make a quick thing in regarding to YouTube, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> that Actually, this was one from that last exchange in regard to me impersonating myself, which has another point to bring up in a moment. And they responded... After YouTube had chimed in and removed that strike, as you would have all, that's why I'm here now, for those watching on YouTube, and I have my chat here set up today with all of them, so I can see all of you today, wherever you're commenting, but they responded almost a week later, after YouTube had removed it, admitting that they were in error, or, you know, at, quote, mistake, when really it was just to censor and suppress in that moment, leaving the other one that's for the same impersonation thing from before, nonsense, but a week later, YouTube reaches out on Twitter, replying to a comment on my thing, right? Like not even the actual thing. Didn't want this to get much attention. Update, YouTube doesn't allow content that contains spam, scams, or other deceptive practices. So now what, are they litigating this on Twitter? Like they gave me a notification. They said it was impersonation. Then they came back and said, oops, our bad, not impersonation, but left the original one that's still for impersonation. And now on Twitter, in response to a random comment that's not even related, they claim that, no, 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 it wasn't impersonation. It was spam and scams and stuff. And we're just supposed to take that at face value? One, I mean, think about how incredibly unaccountable this is. I mean, it's just insulting. I mean, and it could be any one of these things. Who knows? It just Why don't we just say you did something? Which, by the way, I'm going to remember to play JP's video that I forgot to play the other day because it perfectly ties in with this but as i said youtube team youtube responds out of the blue almost a week later after youtube already admitted it was a mistake mistake and removed the strike while not removing the older strike for the same absurd impersonation suddenly changing their excuse via twitter <laughs> calling it spam now not impersonation but spam seems totally legitimate I mean, gosh darn it, these, it's out, it, I feel like they feel that they're out of control. Like, I feel like they don't even feel, I mean, think about how bad that looks for them. And obviously, you don't 41 likes and stuff, but it's out there. We are all seeing this right now, and they look really pathetic. The way that they're acting and the way that they're reeling, trying to just say, you know, trying to pretend like they've got some semblance of legitimacy, it's pretty bad. But... That should hopefully suggest that we're making headway here and people are seeing things. Now, I also want to give a quick shout out in the same note to uh, Kevin Barrett here from Veterans Today. Now, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of the outlet. I've seen a lot of things that I think they lean heavily into their sources, which I don't know whether or not they, they exist. My point is I don't like to lean on sources that I can't verify, so I don't tend to go here. That's not to say one thing or the other. The point is that that's, that's, my, that's my reason, and I have shared their work in the past. But nonetheless, and I should note that I have seen things that I don't think were true, but nonetheless, nobody should be the victim of something like this. They are also being told they're impersonating themselves. 
it's it this is this is what they're doing now to shut down conversation they just don't want. And all they, they're using it as a stopgap. And then maybe, maybe swinging back around if you get enough attention to say, oops, <laughs> our bad, our mistake. So just a quick shout out to the veterans today as well for going through the same thing. And I believe there's plenty of other people. I think, um, who else was it? There was somebody else we were just talking about that had the same thing. And that's this is how I saw it. Thank you, Allo, for pointing it out. But it's happening all across the board. Are we going to believe that veterans today is impersonating themselves or that I'm impersonating myself or, or is it because it's just an easy thing to do to act like it was some glitch? Oops, it was an algorithm glitch because of course you weren't impersonating yourself and it all goes away. It's incredible. But on that note, getting into the beginning point here, I wanted to make a shout out to the interview that I just did with Whitney Webb. Give a shout out because this is an incredible interview. She laid down some information that is so incredibly relevant that definitely flavored the show today as well. 2020 election chaos is being used to set the stage for a final technocratic push. And it's and it's a two-party illusion kind of thing, guys. And that's the problem, is that this is being picked up. The article Whitney wrote is being grabbed onto by a very partisan group. And for the right reasons, because it is happening, but not really give it, seeing the breadth of the picture. The, the fact that it's this is the part. They want us to begin to attack each other for what's happening, so it creates the chaos that they use to push this in. It's very simple, really, at the end of the day. But people don't want to believe that the people that they're supporting are part of it. And so it, and around and around it goes, right? It just doesn't end. But a really important interview. Just want to make sure that was still there. It looked like it was dark. So I hope you guys will take the time to watch it because this is coming your way. And what the, we talk about is, funny enough, exactly what the Washington Post tweeted right here. Perspective. I just love that. Like that then alleviates them of any journalistic ridiculousness that goes on. That's just a perspective. We don't take claim for it. Somebody said it somewhere. Perspective. The election will likely spark violence and a constitutional crisis. I mean, I, mean, it's, I think that's a clear assessment because that's what they have been saying for years for, since 2016. So it just becomes set in people's minds. But what do we really have to just make that broad assumption? I mean, really, think about it. There's always been political vitriol here. But it says, in every scenario except a Biden landslide, our simulation ended in ca catastrophically. So essentially, unless we vote in Biden, our country's going to go to hell. That's what they, that's what, that, that is called election manipulation. <laughs> They're overtly trying to influence the election. And it's pretty damn disgusting as they point to everybody everywhere else except themselves. Now, here's an article. We are facing the biggest election nightmare in modern American history, no matter who ends up winning. I'm not going to go through this entirely, but really at all, I just want you to read this for yourself. It's a fantastic piece of journalism that's pointing out how many concerns we actually have here. And the fact that, I mean, even, even just taking one point from this article, talking about the, ba the, the mailing and the, ba the ballots, mail-in ballots and all this, which is a huge, become a huge political point, which I think was really just used to drum up discussion and support for a dying thing, which is the post office, but whatever. The bottom line is, if they do that, or, and there's going to be any number of things like this, it will just add a big, incredibly long delay to the results, which will only expand out what we're dealing with now and everything else that comes along with it. And this is just, it's just, this is being created for chaos. That's how I see it. And I hope you'll read this because it's a great piece of work, but this is what we went over in the interview. That in every possible way, they are telling you right now, this is going to be shut down. There's going to be martial law. There's going to be chaos. Oh, it's going to have, we're going to, we're going to have to postpone the election. Every simulation and every discussion anyone's having in the mainstream is basically coming to that conclusion. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen. So we'll have to see how it ultimately pans out. But check this out as well before I move on to the starting point here. This is real right now. This is an app on your phone called Reface app, which I probably shouldn't even talk about it because now everyone's going to get it. But this is this is deep fakes. You can literally make a fake and watch the clip. Now I I don't know how if it looks as real as that video looks, but damn, if it even looks close to that, we are going to see this everywhere in 2020. Do you? I wonder why they suddenly now have this app being, being promoted, an app that allows you to literally make fake news on Twitter. Like that's like you can't even discuss certain things on Twitter. But here's an app that lets you make fake videos about whoever you want with anyone's face. No big deal. <laughs> the point is that this is going to be used and it will, whether it's the app itself or the, the simple idea that now it's so ubiquitous that we have to think that way, which we really should anyway. But of course, they're only going to apply it to bad guys, Iran and Syria and, you know, whatever they will, the bad guy perception. It won't be us, the good guys doing it. Of course not. We are set, they're setting us up for the most catastrophic, just it's, this is going to, in my opinion, the election is being set up to completely fall apart for obvious reasons. Pretty crazy to me. 
But on that note, speaking of the elections, because this is where we're going to begin today, and trust me, this ties in with the whole COVID-19 because they are one and the same as I see it right now. This is alarming. And this is another article written by Whitney Webb entitled, Meet the IDF-linked Cybersecurity Group Protecting U.S. Hospitals Pro Bono. Now, we were going to talk a little about this on the interview, but we decided to focus just on the other article because it was so important to where everything was. But this is incredible. Let me make sure you guys got the full image. Okay, good. Now, this ultimately comes down to the same idea we've been talking about. This, this influence from the Israeli intelligence network and Unit 8200 companies and this influence over pretty much everything that's happening in our country today. I mean, we've talked, I don't have to go rehash all the things we've already talked about, but vote, you know, the voting machines and voting software and 911 call centers, like crazy stuff that's being routed out of companies that are tied back to Israeli intelligence. It's, it's, I mean, that should be alarming regardless of what foreign country it is, but because it's Israel, you can't even comment it on because you're racist, right? You're racist to point out that a foreign government might have influence over another government. I don't know how that's racist, but (laughs) go figure. We keep getting called racist for that, but this is really happening. And now we're seeing something where, in at least in one aspect of this, and the other parts of it are just as alarming, in my opinion, are using this to essentially pretend that they're stepping in to help everybody. But in the process, basically taking control of massive infrastructure. Now it says, hardly any media attention has been given to the dramatic and unsettling changes that have been made to hospital and healthcare information technology, IT, systems and infrastructure under the guise of helping the U.S. healthcare system cope with the surge in data as well as an unsettling uptick in cyber attacks. Now, just starting off with the hospitals and healthcare, I mean, that's obvious, right? I mean, right now where we are, this is this is centered around healthcare, centered around biosecurity, biowarfare. So if you can take controls of hospitals and healthcare infrastructure, well, then couldn't you fake something like this? You're damn right you could. So I'm not saying that's happened. I'm just saying, think about how relevant it is in this moment to have groups that we're going to get into, and you'll see why it's so relevant, the group that we're talking about, having control over healthcare information and hospitals in the middle of a system or a situation where we're quickly finding out that we've been lied to. Very interesting. And now you have to ask yourself if whether that was part of this, right? Whether that was the point, allowing this breakdown in the beginning early to allow them to push in and take control over this stuff as we go forward. I mean, we have to be honest with ourselves that the actions and reactions, rather, of our government when this started, whether real or not, understand, this could have been a show or however you want to look at it, was very clearly put out as incompetent. I mean, the lack of action, damn near close to, right? So that's this that would justify this. Now, it says, over the past several months, 80% of healthcare institutions in the U.S. have reported being targeted by some sort of cyber attack. Why haven't we heard about that? Like to that, to that degree, 80%, are you kidding me? And we haven't, I mean, I'm, I may have heard about a few things being lobbed at Iran, which she makes a point out in this article that, oh, you know, it looks like Iran or China are trying to take information, but 80% of our institutions, I mean, if that was really the case, that would be all over the news. If this was something, if they really thought it was Iran or they thought they could blame it on them. But interestingly, no, no one seems to at least report that 80% of our healthcare institutions have been targeted by cyber attacks. And it says ranging from minor to severe with an uptick in phishing attempts and spam. Specifically, most of the attempts, and this is relevant, have been aimed at illegally acquiring troves of patient data. Now, how, why in the world would China or Iran want illegal patient data? I mean, I'm sure you could think of reasons. But then consider why that, who, who that would be far more relevant to. I don't know, somebody manufacturing a fake pandemic? It says directly affected the facility's capacity to function optimally with a mach, um, excuse me, mach, much smaller percentage of those, including ransomware attacks. Now it says one of the reasons for the increase in the success of these attacks has been the fact that, that more healthcare IT workers are working remotely as well as the fact that IT staffers have been laid off or let go completely. Again, one of the byproducts of where we are, which didn't necessarily have to happen, right? The way that this went down created the circumstance which led to that. I mean, you didn't need to give $6 trillion to big business. That could have been just as easily given to everything else, hospitals, individuals, small businesses, right? Let's not, let's not miss that part. So because there's suddenly a lack of these people, well, now we have a lack of the, we have basically have more opportunity for people to influence the technology. Now it says, in several recent instances, 
the removal of entire hospital system IT staffs have been tied to a large effort by the Department of Health and Human Services. Robert Cadleck, Azar, the, I mean, one of the most, one of the groups that you should not take your eyes off during this whole thing. In particular, Cadillac. The system, IT staffs, it says, I don't, don't want to lose the point, several recent instances, the removal of entire hospital system IT staffs have been tied to larger efforts by HHS to consolidate control over patient data, including coronavirus-related data with the assistance of secretive government contractors with long-standing ties to HHS. Oh, so they're building a little insulated control system around the information. So let me read it again. In several instances, the removal of those IT systems led to the in intentional consolidated control of patient data. You know, I mean, again, you could argue that this was something, I mean, wh why would that be the obvious go-to? Especially with everything we know about the people involved. It seems to me that this is a consolidation of information that was necessary to something they're trying to achieve. With the assistance of secret government contractors with long-standing ties to HHS. Sounds totally legitimate. As a, re as a result, there has been a renewed push for the improvement of cybersecurity at hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare institutions. You know, problem, reaction, solution, right? Amid the back door, excuse me, backdrop, almost kind of perfect anyway, an odd group of cyber threat intelligence analysts with ties to the U.S. government, Israeli intelligence, and tech giant Microsoft, it's almost like you, if I would have asked you to pick the three groups involved, you probably would have picked those three, have volunteered, oh, how kind of them, to protect U.S. healthcare institutions for free and even directly partnered with U.S. federal agencies to do so. So get this. So the whole thing begins with, I mean, obviously with COVID-19 and the lack of personnel to, to be involved, the attacks that are happening, the cyber attacks, 80% of which, right? And this is, again, having with involvement of these very same people we're mentioning. But the fact that then it sets up the scenario for the U.S. government, the Israeli intelligence, and tech giant Microsoft, of all people, of all entities tied directly to Bill Gates to volunteer to protect these very things. And of course, partner directly with the U.S. government to do so. Like, you know, think about that. Like, if, if you don't want to believe these entities could lie to you, well, that sounds perfectly normal. But if you see it as what it is, these, these are like the obvious red flags of the last people you should trust in any circumstance, co co coalescing control, condensing this around them into a circle where nobody else can get in. That's that, that and it, you know, it could be for your safety or it could be for something much more nefarious. Now it says they've also recently expanded to offer their services to governments and social media platforms. Oh, so nice of them to target, analyze and neutralize. Guess what? Disinformation campaigns related to coronavirus. Now, remember as well that this is something that, you know, the idea of this has already been floated in the past. It, whether we're talking cyber attacks or things like this in regard to disinformation, these kind of entities, this is not new. All of this stuff is coming together for just different justifications, like everything else about COVID-19. While these analysts have claimed to have altruistic motives, its members who have identified themselves publicly have notably dedicated much of their private sector careers, guess what, to blaming other, other states, namely Iran and China, for hacking and most recently for cyber security, uh, cyber attacks related to the coronavirus crisis, as well as the 2020 presidential campaign, all of which tied back to the very entities tied up within this project and none of them had any actual substance of evidence of any kind other than this is my intelligence and it says they did it. And then all of the media runs with it and says, Iran did it, we knew it. Because that's good journalism. You blindly trust a source that's been shown to lie in the past. Good stuff. But that's the point. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, that's what you get when you try when you don't realize that companies and you know altruistic, you know philanthropic philanthropic entities that Bill Gates is creating, right? The, the idea is it looks like things are happening. Oh, we're helping people. At the end of the day, it all comes. It all becomes this big circle of profit and control, right? It's it's an illusion. And so if these are the people that are setting up the problems, they then point to and say, Iran did it. And then they say, well, here's how we know we did it. It turns out it was their information that they're not even showing evidence to back up. It just becomes a circle of confirmation. There's no actual accountability in there. But because we just say, well, they're altruistic and they're doing it for good things. Look, they're doing it for free. Well, they must be good people, right? This is assumption and it's ridiculous with the kind of people we're dealing with here. 
Now, this is the most, this is so insulting. I swear they do this to poke fun at the people like us that know what we're looking at. The things like Patriot Act, like it's insulting. They're calling themselves, guess what? The cyber version of Justice League. <laughs> real, you were all humble, right? The COVID-19 Cyber Threat Intelligence League that was created earlier this year in March and has described itself as the most, the first global volunteer emergency response community defending and neutralizing cybersecurity threats and, you know, censoring people who say what we don't agree with. And they offer their services, they say, pro bono. Right? Sure, we'll do it for free. We'll take complete control over your infrastructure and your information and have it all funneled through us. Yeah, it's on the house. Now, it says, since its creation, the CTI League has offered its services to sectors entirely unrelated to healthcare systems. Who saw that coming? Right? So the point is they get their foot in the door with the healthcare systems, and then they now offer their services to critical infrastructure systems throughout the U.S., you know, like dams, nuclear reactors, chemical plants, and other things that are totally unrelated and not important at all, according to their inaugural report and their contact form. So you see how quickly that just shifted into complete control over infrastructure, including nuclear reactors and chemical plants? Good times. It's all because of COVID-19, though, and it's all for, sa it's all for your safety. It's all of a sudden a complete condensing of control in a very tight circle because of COVID-19, but within regard to things that have nothing to do with it. It says there's no oversight regarding who can become a member of this league. Did you hear that correctly? So these are people that, a very small group of closed circle of people that have control over infrastructure like these things that could cause catastrophic problems should they want to do something, have no oversight outside of the group that already lets these people in. So it's, it's, a, it's an insider's club. They decide who comes in. You don't get to vote on this stuff. This is the league's team of expert volunteers also tackle alleged disinformation. Associate, it says associate COVID-19 spread with the distribution of 5G equipment was one of the discussions. Oh, remember that one? Like that discussion about how we already verified that in the UK and different places, I think it was Australia, they're already, okay, good, we have our new system up and running. How they do that? Well, because they were installing it during the COVID-19 pandemic and that was 5G. That's not a secret, but see, because we put it together in one sentence and say they were installing 5G during the pandemic and they'll say that we're suggesting that's why it happened. Well, that's not what I said, but they'll say fake news. But then at the same time, have the mainstream media announce how we have our new detection system up and running with the Internet of Things and it's a 5G technology. It's, wait a minute. They just literally said they installed that during COVID. I mean, it's, it's a joke. They play semantics. They pretend that you're misinterpreting or thing you're mis you're trying to misinform people by stating what the box of mass says, right? It's all crazy. But you see it listed right there. That's one of the things the CTI League is focused on. People who associate COVID-19 spread with the distribution of COVID-19. Of course, you could argue that means both one or the other, that it causes it or whatever. But you're not allowed to talk about it. Or, and get, get this, or simply encouraging citizens to break quarantine. Or inciting a First or Second Amendment rally. So you're now you're not even allowed to c gather people to rally about your rights? Oh, I guess that's fake news. That's disinformation, according to this, <laughs> this group. I mean, look, I'm not making this up. It's listed right there. Insight, a First or Second Amendment rally. That is disinformation that they need to push back against. That is literally what it says. So now arguing you have a Second Amendment or First Amendment right during COVID-19 is apparently disinformation. Talk about chilling. Now, it says, since they began, quote, working with U.S. authorities, the CTI League has increasingly taken to assigning blame to nation states, specifically, you guessed it, Russia, China, and Iran for various cyber intrusions, just as the U.S. federal authorities began to do the same. What a coincidence, right? Just as they kind of started working together, suddenly they became the focus. Now, all of this, as I said, ties back to things that they claim. Think of it like a big, uh, just a multiplying Pompeo. This is be what happened. Trust us. Intelligence says, oh, no, we can't see it. But I showed it to you over and over and over. And she goes deep into that in the article, but I'm going to go past it now since I've talked about it quite a bit on this show. But she says, much of the league's leadership has a rather dubious track record. This is great. Regarding past claims linking state actors to cyber attacks. Now, just what she goes into, that basically most of the people involved in this group, most of the people who are the ones making the claims about who is responsible have an obvious track record of making claims that ended up not being true. Isn't, isn't that fantastic? But sure, they're still in leadership positions and they're still able to make these claims and the U.S. government still helps. I mean, it's 
it, it needs to show you that making faulty claims is not only not bad, but it's actually part of the job description. That's why you have mainstream media that lie and get wrong and fake sources and over and over and over, and they not only don't lose their job, they get promoted. And the people like Jesse Ventura, the people that get things right, they get pushed down and removed because you're not allowed to tell the truth when you're not told you can. Mainstream media. Liars telling you that bad guys are doing bad things. Trust me. Now it says Clear Sky and the Manufactured Iranian Threats is the public face of the CTI League and its original founder is none other than a young Israeli named Uhad Zeidenberg, who has previously, who was previously, quote, an award-winning commander in Israeli military intelligence unit 8200. So the leading face, or at least the public face of this entity that now has control over very, power, very important infrastructure such as, you know, nuclear plants and chemical plants and things like that, is, is not only a former, former, same thing as, is there ever a former CIA member? A former mil, part of the military intelligence group, Unit 8200 of Israel. Is that not absurd? I mean, just for, just for some, some uh, perspective, let's pretend for a moment that was somebody from, you know, a Russian intelligence outfit. Does that make you feel better? Why is one better? Why? Because they say Israel's our ally? It doesn't matter. The truth is that Israel has more examples of cheating and lying and stealing and, you know, literally robbing nuclear technology from this country than, than pretty much anybody else that I can point to. But yet here we are. And that's okay. Zeidenberg specialized, in, guess what, in acts of cyber warfare targeting Iran. But sure, it's all Iran, right? This guy literally specialized in exactly what they're doing. <laughs> it's just, you, 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 it's as if they literally wrote this out of a novel and tried to make it just perfect enough where you could read into it and see what was happening, right? You don't miss that. Oh, weird. He specialized in exactly the thing that they're framing them for now and the thing that they're saying Ron is doing right now. It's, I mean, it's, it's a joke. And by the way, if they had evidence of it, that would be a different thing, but they don't. They're saying this happened. The media writes on it. Nothing ever happens. No investigation. No evidence is produced. We just, I've been saying this for a long time. Our government is now riding on the assumption that they just get to state things and, it, and, it, and they're doing so. I mean, in every single scenario, the U.S. government is no longer verifying pretty much anything that it's saying. They are simply saying this is the case because intelligence. The media dutifully goes along with it like the propaganda outlets that they are. And it just becomes sort of truth, right? Repeat it often enough and becomes the truth. And even if we come back weeks later, like with like a Bolivian coup and say, oh, look, it was obviously not what the U.S. said it was. It's too late. We're already there. No one, no one cares. And if you bring it up, they just go, oh, isn't that fake? Who cares? Let's talk about over here. Oh, my gosh, look at Venezuela, right? And everybody loses track. And guess what? Eva Morales is still deceited and they still have an illegal military run government. Good times. Now, says Zeidenberg is also the lead cyber intelligence researcher at Clear Sky Cybersecurity, an Israeli company directly partnered with the Unit 8200. Fantastic. Now, a company with a long history of fraud and espionage targeting the U.S. federal government. I mean, it doesn't get more ridiculous than that. This is a guy tied with Unit 8200 Israeli intelligence working for a company that is also tied with Unit 8200 Intelligence and a company that has a long history of fraud and espionage against the very government that they are now giving control of their asset or rather of their infrastructure. I mean, it's like you win. It's like you go and find the most obvious bad candidate, somebody who has a history of robbing and and using, you know, like if let's just take the nuclear plant example. It's like you take someone who has actually failed at making one work, somebody who has actually done things that are the opposite of what they want done, somebody who is a criminal, a murderer, a rapist, and they go perfect. Let's bring that guy in to run the infrastructure, right? It's it's that stupid to have somebody with this kind of a dubious back record of lying about the things they're doing, about a record of actual espionage in regard to the government they're working in. God, it makes your head spin. So now you need to ask, why in the world is it being allowed? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to venture a guess that if this was an actual government of the U.S. that actually had agency to make its own choices, that it wouldn't be allowing something this ridiculous. So... You, you read into that what you will. Zeidenberg is also a researcher for Tel Aviv University Institute for National Security Studies, say INSS. He's specifically affiliated with the INSS's uh, Lipkin Shahak program, 
which is named after the former head of Israeli military intelligence, focuses on national security and democracy in the era of post-truth and fake news. You know, the, 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 the illusion they put up when they're the ones creating those things. The program works directly with the Israeli government and the IDF. So not only is he tied to doing these things in the past, tied with intelligence, tied with a company that is openly, you know, espionage, robbing and stealing from our government. He also works directly with the government anyway and the IDF during this while he's right now. I mean, it's just, it's, I, it, it's unreal. I mean, you know, there are some times where you're getting into these things where it's like, I'm, you know, I, I mean, you, you, you've seen that I've already went over it, I've already highlighted it. But even as I go through these things a second time, a third time, a fourth time, it, it just increasingly blows my mind. It really does. It's out, and there's a whole part in here that I hope, all of this I hope you'll read. Showing you the fact, this is the part I'm mentioning about them making up the claims, right? These are the people that are saying it's happening. They have a dubious track record and it hinges on their word. And they're the ones involved in the company that's benefiting from making the claims. It's just as stupid as any other situation we're talking about. Robert Cadleck in his profit conflict of interest, Monsef Salawi in his conflict of interest. I mean, over and over and over. If you can't see what these people are doing, you are choosing not to see. Now, in regard to Microsoft, because that's also part of this, don't forget, other founding members of the CTI League are Nate Warfield and Chris Mills. Warfield is a former self-described gray hat, somebody who's a professional who violates laws or common ethic standards, it says, but without malicious intent. So I guess that's a very subjective perception. Now works as a senior program manager for the Microsoft Security Response Center. Mills also currently works for the same group, as a senior program manager, and he previously created the U.S. Navy Computer Forensics Lab, <laughs> excuse me, while serving in the Navy's Cyber Defense Operations Command. So people that work with Microsoft now, who have very clear crossover between our military, or even our, you know, intelligence, and, you know, just public world. I mean, that, the thing, they're the ones <clears throat> now working with a group like Microsoft, who, you know, is controlled by shareholders and and you know it's a company it's not it's not a government that's you know quote accountable to its populace which obviously that's not what our government is but the fact that that's what he once did and now he's working with them in regard to this whole project is just this crossover we're seeing with all this stuff is very alarming and it's been going on for quite a long time now the it's called the microsoft security response center is heavily focused on pursuing the cyber security needs of microsoft customers which include, of course, the U.S. government, specifically the U.S. Department of Defense. And what is one of the agendas of the U.S. Department of Defense? That's right, going after the exact same people this whole thing was centered on. Now, it is worth noting that the Microsoft group is also directly affiliated with Microsoft's Election Guard. You may have heard that before. A voting machine software program that was developed by companies closely tied to the Pentagon's infamous research branch, DARPA, and Israeli Military Intelligence Unit 8200, and creates several risks to voting security despite claiming to make it safer, right? The thing that's supposed to guard the election, which also has ties back to Israeli government and Israeli military intelligence, good times. But the fact that Microsoft's election guard, all tied in with, you can see the ties to this, this, the where it's all coalescing around the election, using COVID-19, around all of this stuff. I mean, you realize that the idea of the election, the idea of protecting the election from hacking from outside entities very, very much leads to the same kind of in, uh, in uh, control, the same kind of encroaching, tightening control, whether it's justified by hacks or cyber attacks or by COVID-19 and safety, it ends up being the same thing. And that's real time we're seeing that. You, we need to be able to recognize how they're just grabbing on to whatever they can to keep driving in the agenda. Now it says, it is certainly interesting that the four founding members of the CTI League share ties to the same military intelligence agencies and associated corporations, as well as an interest in the same group of alleged Iranian hackers. Now it says, though claims of altruism with partnerships with powerful corporations and government agencies, the CTI League has been able to position itself within the critical infrastructure of hospitals and the U.S. healthcare system, as well as attempting to expand into other key networks, such as those tied to dams and even nuclear reactors. I mean, how can you even justify that in such a short period of time? I mean, right? I mean, the, the idea is ultimately because, well, we need to protect them because of the election and we're claiming Iran and China are trying to hack us. Oh, we need to prove it? No, no, we don't prove it. We'll just, we're, we're just going to ride on the, on the words of people who have lied about those exact things in the past and put, allow those same people to use that faulty claim that hasn't been verified to drive in and take more control over infrastructure. 
So really, you ask whether that was the point to begin with, and they go, hey, how do we get control of the infrastructure? Well, let's make up this claim and make this group and create this whole thing and blah, blah, blah. And you could see how these things work. People don't want to pretend that's how these things operate, but I argue that's how governments have always operated. And that's what we're li literally living with right now. Now it says, it is truly stunning that a group whose un unnamed members are vetted only by the people involved, including the public face, the person that works directly with the Israeli government, has been cleared to access critical private and public networks all because of, a, of the pandemonium caused by the coronavirus crisis and the league's offering of their service pro bono. Now think about that. There, the whole claim is this is about the election, right? The election and Iran and China and Russia hacking or cyber attacks. Arguably, none of those things have anything to do with COVID-19. But interesting to note that without COVID-19, that wouldn't be happening. Right? We've had these kind of cyber attacks and threats and the discussions forever. But because COVID-19, they argue that they need to allow this kind of all-encompassing control to a very small group of people because otherwise we won't be able to protect ourselves. And it's all because COVID-19. So however you spin the dial, it is just they're using this. It is be or possibly it was all part of the same agenda. Either way, it's leading to the same outcome. That is the point. Notably, a considerable part of the strain that led hospitals and healthcare institutions to request the leak services, such as budget cuts or the firings of IT staffers, were act oh shit, I forgot it does that. Were actually the result of government policy, either due to the state or federal budget cuts for healthcare systems or health and human services efforts to consolidate control over patient data flows into the hands of a few. For your safety, right? Because we need to have it all well, it ultimately ended up being the opposite. Right. They not only do these actions very clearly lead to more problematic situations for this country, for the Americans in this country, but or you know anybody in this country. But at the same time, their act, their active actions on the lies, the numbers that weren't true, cunning these people, acting ahead of time, claiming. And remember, the claims that we're finding out is they did these things telling us it was real. But in their minds, it was because we don't want the hospitals to be overrun. Right. Even though whether that's a real claim or not, the point is they lied to us. So arguably they did it so it wouldn't happen. But nonetheless, they cut all these people to, to you know alleviate the issue. And then that is exactly the thing that gave them the control. Problem, reaction, solution, or however you want to spin this, right? You continually see their very actions create the justification they need to drive in something they've been trying to accomplish over and over and over. Now, one, twice, maybe three times, who knows? It could be coincidence. But this many times in every single aspect since the beginning, since the beginning of this country, then yeah, you need to begin to see the reality. <clears throat> it says, in other words, these government policies directly led to a situation where hospitals and healthcare institutions would, out of desperation, be more likely to accept the pro bono offer from these entities. Otherwise, they would be under more normal conditions. Now, here's the point. What does that remind you of? What do I keep talking about? Driving people to desperation so they don't care what the answer is. They just want it to end. That's U.S. sanctions. That's what's happening to multiple countries around the world. They are being starved to death so they don't care about whether a horribly authoritarian government steps in like the U.S. government and takes control or their government they had before takes control. They don't care what happens. They just want the problem to end. Right? I mean, think about how incredible that is. And that's that's happening to us right now. We are right now under U.S. sanctions. Americans are suffering from this. And the same thing they just did to the hospitals. They created a situation where the hospitals were desperate. They had no alternative. So they had no choice but to accept the obviously, uh, what's the term they use? The Anyway, it's, it's a, God, I want to use that term. <laughs> it's a secondhand, it's something that is not what it seems. And I bet you they saw that to some degree. Didn't have any solution. Now, it says U.S. and Israeli intelligence communities have been seeding the narrative over a year. Like we've been saying, they've been constantly saying this for longer than that. I understand They're constantly saying you know, hacks and elections and meddling and constant since 2016. I've been hearing that regarding the upcoming hacks of critical U.S. infrastructure on or around the U.S. 2020 election scheduled for November 3rd by groups affiliated with the government of Iran, Russia and or China. Of course, only those ones, right? Even though Israel has an all a very clear role, including on this country. But, you know, who cares? Despite its massive conflict of interest, the opaque group is now nestled within much of the U.S.'s critical infrastructure, enjoying little, if any, oversight. Why is that not incredibly alarming to everybody? Ostensibly justified by the League's altruism. That's it. 
The group's opaqueness could easily lend itself to be used as the springboard for a false flag cyber attack to fit the very narrative pushed by the very people involved and then in a self-fulfilling prophecy. They create the, fault, the, the fake entity that happened, the fake action, the fake event. Then they say, see, we told you it was going to happen and there you go. Now, of course, you can use that same logic in reverse, right? It's the same thing people have posted or have floated before that Russia comes out and says, hey, U.S. is planning a cyber attack. And they go, well, they're doing that because they're going to they're going to do it, right? There, there's plenty of times you can see this play out, and it applies to everybody. The point is, you should apply history, actions of the of the government, and think critically. And in this case, we have every single reason possible to think that they would be capable of something like this. I mean, Duma, false flag, and Duma is one of the most recent we could think about that's been a hundred percent verified. In every stretch of the imagination, anybody that wants to read a mainstream article from Bellingcat and that has really no counter to what they've been saying and just act like that gives them an ape, the word, debunked, that's fine. You're forever lost if you think these people are trying to tell you the truth. When you have countless people that worked in the entity, that were there on the ground, we have people, different journalists, all these people saying it was a false flag, that they staged this, they lied about that, they pushed them to say these things. It was obviously orchestrated, and then people died. They launched attacks on Syria because of that. The U.S. government did. Trump's administration did. It was a lie. So here we are staring in the face right now with an opaque group who right now is, is just perfectly set up to do exactly that. From a national security perspective, she says, allowing CTI leak to operate in this capacity would normally be unthinkable. Yet instead... This suspect organization is openly partnered with the U.S. government and U.S. law enforcement. It allows them to place the fingerprints, and talking about the Umbridge program, of, of, of basically Chinese, Russian, or Iranian-affiliated hackers on anything that they, that they would conduct. Any forthcoming cyber attack should be thoroughly investigated before blame is assessed, as always, but of course, what we tend to see is the exact opposite, which is which usually needs to show you something. You know, after COVID-19 just starts and they're already grabbing the microphone and China did it. It's like, okay, well, maybe, but that seems a little suspicious. And that's the same kind of thing here. When we see these new events and the U.S. government jumps up and screams about how their intelligence knew, interesting. Also note how we never end up seeing that intelligence. Hmm, also very interesting. But this is incredibly alarming. This kind of overt control to foreign entities or just to suspect entities within our government, it needs to really show you what's going on right now. And this is being, they're, they're gathering this stuff right in front of us. They're condensing their control over all of these things. And here's another one. I mean, I, this one is almost, this one is very interesting to me. The way that this is going down, the CDC is America's new landlord. The CDC. The CDC, is, it's just, it's, it, what, in what world do they think that this is something that they have the ability to do? Now, obviously, they're going to give you their justification for it. But it says the Centers for Di the Centers for Disease Control and, and Prevention, operating under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is very important not to forget, all ties back to the same people, has asserted jurisdiction over private residential leases nationwide. Oh, you didn't know about that? Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why the fantastic mainstream media is not informing you about what's going on. I'm not saying they haven't talked about this somewhere or you wouldn't find articles here or there or show clips about it, but it's not, that should be huge news. They have taken control, jurisdiction over private residential leases across the country. It, it says it intends to curtail evictions, which by the way, is something that I think is a good thing, but not that the CDC should take control over all of it to do. It's just, it's very, I mean, the idea that evictions should essentially, I mean, right now, if we're talking about, if evictions are put on hold, if there's a moratorium on evictions and all these things, well, that then the government is then obligated to not spend $6 trillion on big business that's going to fire people and sell out anyway, but to use that money to help, you know, stimulate the economy actually, not just bail out their friends. And in doing so, you could basically give money to people that would otherwise be losing it right? People that don't need to pay rent, there's a benefit there, but people that have, you know, people who, the renters, or the, the people that own the buildings. You could essentially, because then the contract stays in place, because it's still being paid, it's just being the government's helping out while this is happening. Why? In my opinion, because the government created the whole situation. But what's happening is the Centers for Disease Control, which is, you know, an entity of the government controlled by Health and Human Services, which is the point, all of this is co condensing around these obvious entities, they're now in control, taking jurisdiction over all of these things, 
in order to claim it's to stop evictions. But that's this is going to be catastrophic. It says it intends to curtail evictions until at least the end of the year. And in fact, and the problem is that all these people are going to, you know, that are want to, that don't want to pay rent are going, to, hey, that's fantastic, without thinking about the dangers of what that's creating. Because you understand that could just as easily happen with a mandate from, even though I argue all these things are unjust, but this is unjust too. My point is to, you could do this without handing over a massive amount of control to a very, very corrupt organization. Now, interestingly, think about the fact that the Health and Human Services is controlled by the State Department, Donald Trump. Right? I mean, Trump's administration, arguably, has control. Not arguably, ostensibly, Trump has control over all of this. So if the Centers for Disease Control, which is a company, an entity that is, you know, in the middle of the, the argument in regard to who, you know, World Health Organization and, and Fauci and all this different stuff. I mean, realize that Fauci is tied in with these very exact same groups, right? So it's this whole muddled argument that there's this side over here inside. It's clearly crossing over. But health and human service is doing so. It just shows you that there's more so happening here, obviously. And this takes control over, I mean, this case, this, this gives them jurisdiction over any kind of agreement that's been made and essentially alleviates the concern for it. So now suddenly people who once made this agreement to pay rent or so whatever kind of feel like that they don't need have to anymore. And what if they bring it back and they no longer feel, I mean, there's so much open here. But it says it intends to curtail evictions until at least the end of the year. And in fact, its new directive threatens federal criminal penalties <clears throat> against landlords who ignore tenant declarations made using CDC forms. So you have to fill out a CDC form, Center for Disease Control. <laughs> now just leave the P off, right? Because they don't, I don't care about prevention. It's about control, right? That's find that incredibly obvious. But you have to use a CDC form to declare that you don't have money to pay rent. And then they're just going to say that you don't have to pay rent. It says it is unclear, to put it mildly, exactly how this jurisdiction over private contracts and state local courts flows even to Congress, much less an administrative agency acting on its own. Yeah, right? An unaccountable agency that's not voted in. But realize, it's not really about the rent. That's the excuse they're using to make this make sense to people. Right? No evictions, no rent. The idea that that is what makes this feel right to people who are suffering, and rightly so, because we've been all been put in a position where we are desperately dependent on the government. They did that on purpose. Now, here is the solution, problem, reaction, solution. They step in and go, here you go. We're going to do this for you. But in the meantime, you need to sign your soul over the devil, right? You're going to hand complete control over <laughs> private residential leases across the country to the CDC. But it says, one federal official justifies the bizarre and illegal, or excuse me, legally dubious action based on the CDC's broad charter to stop the spread of communicable diseases. They're actually claiming their charter about stopping the spread of diseases is what gives them the right to do this. As if doing this stops the spread of diseases. I mean, you know how broad that can become? That any of these broad actions can be deemed, the, you know, in the pursuit of stopping the virus. I mean, that is, that is unending. <clears throat> and as it says, the funny thing, as the Mises uh, blog point Institute points out, a charter at which they failed miserably, right? So they're leaning on the charter that, that, that gives them the right to stop spread of diseases, and they clearly haven't even done that. But they're now using it to take control over rental leases? Is anybody concerned about where this is all going? It says Congress has delegated broad authority to the HHS. Yeah, and that's alarming. The Surgeon General and the CDC to take reasonable efforts to combat the spread of communicable diseases. Now, it's not, not a reasonable effort. And frankly, as he says, I think it makes sense for those authorities abroad because we don't know for any given situation or scenario what steps will be needed to stop the spread. Which, by the way, he what he's saying there is we can do whatever we want because we don't know what will end up being needed to stop the spread. And if our mandate is doing whatever needed to stop the spread, well, that means we can do anything if we think it, quote, needs to be done to stop the spread, or that's the justification that's given, such as taking control of the jurisdiction of all rental leases. Because obviously that's going to stop the spread. I mean, you, if you want to try to make this ridiculous, you could say, well, okay, if there are people with, who are being evicted who have nowhere to go, that means that they'll be more likely to spread the virus. Wait, except the fact that all homeless people have shown that they're not spreading it. Oops. <laughs> what does that mean? If you forgot that story, I hope you'll look into that. I talked about it in a recent show. The very odd and very obviously contradictory concept that basically all homeless populations are seemingly in, can barely being touched by this. And even though they don't have the best sanitation and they're, you know, don't wearing, not wearing masks and they're all sleeping right next to each other. I mean, yeah, but that, let's just pretend that makes perfect sense. But that, that I, that's the only thing I could think that makes sense. That they would be evicted and then it would, you know, it's just, it's crazy. 
But it says, again, this was announced without congressional input or approval, purely by administrative decree, meaning administrative, executive order, right? This is coming from the federal government, right? We need to see that because all these things continue to be act like this, in my opinion, is 100% part of the same technocratic agenda. All of this stuff is being, it, the control is being condensed right now in front of you. And if you can't see that Donald Trump and his administration, the Republicans and the Democrats are all part of this, then you're just not paying attention. So administrative decree gave this entity that control. This is at least the eviction and mortgage moratoriums in the CARES Act passed by Congress in March were enacted by politicians who face voters this fall. You know, so we're told. But is, the point is that even, our, you know, even a surface level, right? Where ostensibly we're supposed to believe that they at very least have to be accountable to their constituencies, which I think is a, a big fallacy in and of itself. But nonetheless, the CDC doesn't even have that pretense. There's no accountability. You could decide that, that we are in a dictatorship. I've been saying this since the moment that executive orders were used basically all the time. Obama and even a little before. Like this is, they are now saying we don't need to go through you even though that is an illusion. They just get to write a piece of paper and sign their name. And even though the executive order is not supposed to apply to everybody, only the executive branch. But who cares? Since when did we care about the rules in this country? It says at least the eviction of Morgan's uh, by the CARES Act. It says, and while those earlier moratoriums may well be constitutionally suspect too, and you could argue that, definitely, at least in times of sanity, they were limited to federally backed rentals and mortgages. The CDC's new action is much broader, applying conceivably to all private residential leases across the country. The fallout from suspending rental contracts will be deep and long-lasting. Many landlords will find their situations untenable and stop making mortgage and tax property tax payments, right? Which is ultimately the point. Like this is, in my opinion, just like the collapse of the middle class in this country, which was obviously a, pro a byproduct or the agenda we're dealing with here. It's the same thing here. What happens? You, co you basically condense control in this regard over, you know, companies or whatever, the larger entities, they swoop in just like the businesses, right? All those people that had small businesses, don't, let's not pretend like it's going to be there when you come back. All the big companies have already swept in and taken up all the market, and the, or they will be doing so the moment these things even slightly start to return. That is the point. That is control. We are just, we are not meant to be like them. That's how they see it, right? You have us and you've got them, and we are the people that are supposed to be doing the work. So they alleviated that foggy middle area, right? Where you're kind of getting close to maybe not being that way anymore. Ah, you shoved us back down where we're supposed to be. And you pushed yourselves even further up to the top. So now we're so far apart. That's what this is. And in this case, we're staring at the reality that these companies in the same way are going to step in and take control, the bigger ones. <clears throat> I mean, think about things like the Black Rocks and these big, massive asset companies that are just have, they have all, all hundreds of these smaller side things. And these, these are, come, they're right now, whether it's that group or any other, already prepared to swoop in and take up any lingering aspects of the market and anything they're involved in. That's just good business. So as he's saying, when these landlords just stop doing it because they're not getting what they should, that's that's what's going to happen. New rental houses stock will be depressed as owners worry about the next suspension of rent payments, right? So no one's going to continue to try to get involved in the business because they know it's not certain they're going to get what they deserve. Now they're, uh, that has the precedent has been set. After all, why wouldn't moratoriums happen again when the next pandemic, right? Exactly. They're set, that's the point. This is weird. This is not going away. This is the new normal. So when this swings back around again, we're going to see the same thing. So people won't want to get involved. And what's going to happen? The government will get involved. The government will be in charge of our rental and our housing and our sale. Suddenly, one more aspect of our lives completely controlled by the government if it isn't already. Rental housing units will drop in price as many landlords abandon the business, setting the stage for commercial and private equity buyers to grab units on the cheap from individuals and small owners. Ultimately, foreclosures, evictions, and tax sales will happen no matter what the federal government does, right? The likely outcome is bigger players owning more and more of the rental house stock, consolidating the permanent renter class and adding to the rootlessness many Americans feel. Even the most modest home ownership creates skin in the game and encourages better neighborhoods, while areas dominated by rentals lack the same incentives for improvement. And that shouldn't be taken as a, as a, uh, a, racial thing at all. I mean, I've, who, anyone who's lived in an apartment complex knows very well that people don't care about the apartment complex. I mean, to some degree, but by and large, most people just, you know, they'll spit their gum on the ground. They'll wipe something on the wall. Who cares? It's not theirs. 
But when you own the building or the property or, you know, own, even though we don't really own anything in this country, the point is that you then take a little more ownership. So that, in a way, is driving these two things apart, like I'm talking about. It says, and the new owners of rental units will pass all the uncertainty, risk, and potential losses onto millions of Americans in the form of higher rents. Continuing. This action by the CDC in response to a very manageable and retreating cold virus is the kind of quietly unprecedented development we have come to expect this year, says the Mises Institute, which is a lot of weight. All right, just be clear, I, I, you know, whether or not I agree with that, which I'm sure you know my opinion, the Mises Institute is saying that this very manageable and retreating cold virus, they're talking about COVID-19, is a very, is the kind of quietly unprecedented development that we've come to expect this year, the action they're taking, which means they're ju using something that's not as dangerous as they're saying it is <clears throat> to justify the actions that wouldn't have otherwise been justified, exactly what Robert F. Kennedy said. He says, when you destroy trust and in in contract enforcement, you create terrible ripple effects throughout society. Now, what does that bring to mind? Contact, contract enforcement. Oh, you mean like, you know, UN mandates or you, excuse me, UN resolutions? Oh, you mean like the INF treaty? Oh, you mean like agreements they had with Taiwan or agreements they had with Iran or agreements they had with, I mean, anybody, right? It's in the age of, of 2016 forward, we have seen an unprecedented amount of just disregarding obligations, things that they have no legal or, or you know, even in, completely lacking integrity and honor. You make an agreement, even if it's a previous president, and the idea is it was stepping in and just lying about things and just removing, I mean, I'm not, not to say that all these things were right, but you understand there's a proper way to do these things. If you actually believed it was bad, you could go through it and just say that. You don't need to lie about the other country and say, well, they're, they're doing this and they're doing that and that's why we're leaving, but it's also a bad deal, right? That's why. You don't like what it does, so you just leave without any justification, right? Create contact, contract enforcement. Right? Destroying that, which is what this government has done, creates the world we're in. Nobody trusts anybody. Nobody has any faith in the deals they're making, right? This is all just everyone's, it's a dog eat dog world. War. It creates war. And that's where we are. So, in this little microcosm of that same problem for us, when you destroy the contract enforcement, these are the, we're going to see terrible ripple effects through society. And people won't, you know, people will sign up for contracts and then just never do anything about it. That already happens. Right. But when you have this, this kind of bubble around everything where, you know, it's not, I mean, right now, think about the ideas of people out there rioting, right? We have people who are peacefully protesting. We also have people out there that are taking advantage and rioting or, you know, looting or whatever, right? There are people right now that know they can get away with it because half of our media or half of our government and most of our media are pretending like they're not doing anything while the other half pretends like they're all, you know, that they're all looters when really there are a lot of peaceful protesters, it just creates this kind of illusion. Now, something this radical should not be rushed into place with such little forethought, it says, especially when it amounts to buying votes in a national election. That is an incredibly important thing to think about. Now, this would apply, again, to anybody in the current position. Doesn't matter if it was Obama at the time or Trump now. This situation and what this, whoever the president would be doing this, however you think is justified, would essentially see this as giving people money right in a moment when they're going to see that coming from Donald Trump or Obama or whoever the president would be, right? So the idea of removing rent or obligation from people, which will be catastrophic for this country in so many ways. And again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't find a way to make that happen. Just don't do it with the CDC taking control over these contracts. The point is that, 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 that it's, this is what is it's happening right in front of us. They are paying people, as they're arguing, to basically vote a certain direction. And that's not to say that they will. But if you remove someone's rent and they've been suffering, well, they, they're probably more likely to lean into that. I just think that's incredible. And doing so is destroying a lot of different things that we probably won't even recognize until we're way past this, which is what they're hoping for. Now, it says the CDC wants to effectively... Uh, uh, vitiate contracts. When you tell one party that it need not perform and the other that it cannot sue for non-performance, you radically alter the bargaining power of those parties. The contract they sign becomes nothing more than an aspirational document, a legislative or administrative tool to be rewritten at the will of politicians. The effects of this moratorium undoubtedly will spill over in unforeseen ways as Americans get used to the idea that their financial obligations can be erased 
by state edict, as well as everything else. This is the world they're creating right in front of us. Now understand, the idea is that people in, could be alleviated from this problem if the government had done what they should have done. And that wouldn't have removed the contracts, right? All that's happening is in the interim, the government is basically paying your bills, which they should because they destroyed everything. So the bottom line is what they're doing now is allowing the CDC to take control and just remove it. So nobody gets anything. And the only person really benefiting is the people who have rent. The people who have contracts or, you know, the renter has nothing. This is, in my opinion, meant to screw this up. I mean, I don't even see how this can look any other way. But this is incredible. Talk about con the control. The CDC of all groups, like, what, couldn't you think of a better group to step in and do that if there was going to be a group? But no, it's because it's the biosecurity state. That is what's happening. They are reaching in and taking control of everything. And we need to start paying attention for those that aren't yet not doing so. Now, these are just, understand, too of the many different things we've gone over on this show. I, you know, really, I could have made this show just about that and made it a little more, you know, there were some other things that I just had to get into today. But I hope you will take the time to look through the other things we've talked about. Now, that's, that's about an hour right there. I'm probably going to cut that right there for a show tomorrow, a clip, so you guys can see that. But that that's, this is very real. And I can't express to you how alarming this is when you see these steps being taken. And, I mean, we've been talking about it. And, you, you know, trying to say, look, 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 everybody, look at what's happening. Look at what they're grabbing. And everyone just goes, oh, we're in danger. You know, not everybody, but some. Hopefully we can spread this around. Now, before I get into the other topic, I wanted to make sure I talked about this thing that's circulating the internet. Everyone's talking about it, which is very interesting for a few different reasons. But I've seen this everywhere. People doing little clips about this, and, and it's something that I think we need to be very skeptical about and show some discernment here. Now, Beach Milk says, hold on, I'm very confused. Can someone please help me with this ex an explanation for this? What are all these countries buying COVID test kits way back in 2018? I didn't think they had them, right? Okay, so this caught my attention. It's very interested. So, okay, well, let's see what's going on here. So here, first of all, is the website. Make sure you guys can see it. Okay. Oh, it looks like Okay, good. You can see at the top, WITS, World Integrated Trade Solutions. This is very, this is totally legitimate. It's, I believe, run or at least affiliated with the World Bank. All kinds of information about exports and imports and financial information about trade, right? So you could go look into just about anything, it seems, on here. So you guys can see World Integrated Trade Solution. This is the site. You can see it for yourself, by the World Bank, just in case people are rightly so wondering whether this is even a real website. Now, here is the page that everybody, this is what I was seeing, okay? Okay. When you're looking at it at first glance, you go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, it says COVID-19 test kits, 2019. Well, that's very weird, right? So how does that make sense? And you look into this and it goes back even further. Now, just so you know, you could do this even further. Go back to 2017 and it still says the same thing. COVID-19 testing kits, 2017. Hmm, okay, so my first thought was, okay, there. this is either them being absurdly absurdly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just not careful, right? They're just like, just, no, oh, nobody care. But I find that very hard to believe, but it's definitely possible. Like, let's just be on its, on its face. It is certainly possible that this website run by the World Bank, who I argue is very much tied in with whatever's going on, just, I guess, accidentally forgot to write to, forgot to not put the thing they knew they were going to create in three years. Or have part in creating? Sure, certainly possible. I don't think that's what happened. But I also think it's interesting that, you know, why would nobody have noticed this up until now, if that was the case? These are just things that came to my mind. Okay, so I started digging in. I'm saying, okay, I'm definitely intrigued by this for sure. Now, you'll note up here, it says COVID-19 test kits, imports by country, the date, the year we're looking at. And then it says import, additional product information. And it says diagnostic regions based on immunolog immunological reactions. What this is referring to is the PCR test. Now it says COVID-19 test kits, instruments, apparatus used in diagnostic testing. Now, so my first thought was, okay, what if this is another example of a website updating something now, which retroactively populates the website, which absolutely how these things work. I've done it right now. If I were to go in right now and change the title on something that I have in my website, it would populate over all the things I've shared, including the things that are shared on Twitter and Facebook. Suddenly the title would change after so much period of time. Same thing here. If I were to go in and change something on a category in my website, anywhere that I've posted it over the last 
12 years, would suddenly populate and show the new category, even though it was pop updated now, right? But it was actually published way back then. So that's the first thing I noticed. And you will notice down here that it's saying this is the refreshed, and you can see that, like, you go into the information, you can see that these are, you know, updated as of today, essentially 2020. So that that's the idea. So my first thought is wondering whether or not that's what happened. And you can see here, oh, I, I, already, I already jumped over to the other one. I'll get to that in a second. So that being said, if that's even the case, I think that's ridiculous. And I think that's very obviously dishonest. And I think that's almost very obviously meant to make this happen. Right? Because why would you label COVID-19? Why would you label a PCR test that has been shipped, imported, and outported? Because look, you, here's import. And you can see clearly you've got Germany, European Union, lots of them, right? Millions of these things. United States, Kingdom. So according to this, they've been shipped and imported by basically every country all around the world. Now, if you go here and go to exports, you'll see that it's the same kind of thing. So not only were they importing, but they were also exporting. United States exported in 2017 COVID-19 testing kits. So this is saying. Now I want to show you here something that I thought was interesting. So when you go and look at these things, you can actually change the type. So you got test. Let me make sure. I believe you guys can see that. Yeah, okay, good. So COVID-19 testing kits is one of them. You've got swab and this and that, and you've got other COVID-19 testing kits, but they're two different kinds. Then you've got COVID-19 diagnostic tests, right? So all these have numbers associated with them. So let's look at this one. Okay, so 382200 testing kit. So when you actually look into this stuff, you can find out that these have been around for a long time. Composite diagnostic lab regions, pharmaceutical HS code, and, and these are import exports going back all the way to 2008. And this is a totally separate website. Now, this one was 902. So now we can go to, and I'm just trying to show you the difference in numbers here. Go to the 902 one. Diagnostic test instruments, 902780. Here's this one. Instruments and apparatus for physical chemical analysis on a Canadian page, right? And the, so these are basically, to make the point here, this is what I'm getting to, that these are what, this is my assessment on this that these are things that have been imported and exported for a long time. And there's a lot of different things you can look at, right? Other medical devices, you know, there's all kinds of stuff on here. But what? here's what I think happened. Going back to the 2017 one. Okay. I think they dis very deceptively chose to change in their system something as common as the PCR test to say COVID-19 test kits. Right. So what happened was all the things they had been listed as PCR suddenly updated to COVID-19. And I, 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 very, I think that incredibly suspicious with the intention of doing something like we're dealing with right now. Right. Or, or it's possible that they were ordering these things way back then. Right. But you have to understand there's a couple of different kinds we're staring at here. As well as where was I? Here. Okay. So I also that we see, uh, you know, I mean, let's let's go back here to 2018 real quick so we can see the difference. Okay, so in 2018, the United States was exporting 7 million. And in 2019, exporting a little more, 200,000 more. Go to import. And these are PCR tests. That's what we're talking about. Imports. Okay, so in 2019, importing 4,400,000. 2018, importing about the same, right? So you don't see much of an increase or much of a change. So ultimately, it seems to suggest this has been something that's been going on for quite a while and that these tests, if, if you understand it, oh, you're kidding me. Oh, you got to be kidding me. I can't believe this. <laughs> Well, it looks like I'm going to be posting this video again. Wow. My stream just got cut. I'm just trying to wait for it to come back online for those that are watching po at, at me. Quite incredible.
This happens far too often for people that aren't familiar with this. Hey, now we're back online. Well, I just wanted to wait because I'm not going to play that at the end. So don't get excited now. It looks like we're back online. So for all those that were lost there for a minute, maybe some of you were getting the feed still, we're back. So I don't know where that ended up cutting off, unfortunately, which is really frustrating to me. It looks like it wasn't that long ago. Somebody give me in the chat. Let me, if you want to give me a comment on where this left off, something's quick and easy. So I know where to pick up on because this is important and I don't want to re rehash that all over again. I'm going to keep going. Give me in the chat, somebody where we left off here. Now, the point here, what I was getting to is that it seems to me that these are, Man, I'm still waiting for a comment. Anyway, thank you for all of you that are out there watching that are finally coming back on whatever my, I, what I was doing right there while I was off is I was checking my stream, which was perfectly fine. And it was some, the connection that was being cut. So the stream feed was like the, the internet connection was perfect. So who knows what was going on? Maybe it's because I'm talking about this, but the point was guys that I think this boils down to the fact that they updated that something like a PCR test, which is what these are. If, like I said, you can go all the way back to 2017 and you can see them very clearly, whether it's PCR tests or diagnostic tools, like they change these to say COVID-19 diagnostic test instruments and apparatus when those are things that are used for far more than just COVID-19. Right. So I think they intentionally almost change these things to make only to, instead of say PCR test, they make it say COVID-19 test. So people like us will go in and go, what? That's, you know, so much, so long, so much longer before. How does that make sense? And I think it's intentionally meant to manipulate us. That's incredibly suspicious. But I mean, I'm not going to say that it's not possible that they couldn't have just wrote it in there three years ago when literally it seems every country was ordering these things, which again, doesn't mean it's not possible they could hide this, but it's much harder when many countries, and by the way, including countries that are not allies of the United States, were also ordering supposedly COVID-19 test kits. Right. So anyway, I don't want to waste more time on this or should not wasting, but I don't want to spend more time on this. I just, I, I lost you guys there and I hope I got that point across. I don't think this is what people are thinking that it is. Now it, it, it is still something we should consider and I'm sure they'll come out with some kind of a response to it because everyone's pointing to it. But at the end of the day, I think it's pretty clear what this is. And that's my take. But I also wanted to point out, oh, and again, these are, these are all being included in the show notes and the links when I'm done to show you these kind of things, which are, are the, the corresponding numbers and descriptions of the things that they're listing here. And you can find them on other websites, you know, as, including this one going back all the way to 2008, which seems to suggest that these are not only COVID test kits, but just things that they use for all kinds of viruses and that they chose to make it say COVID-19, which is, they're playing a psychological game with us guys, which is one of the big parts of the show we're going to get to. That's what's happening in my opinion. Now I, I want to show this, and this is not meant to call out the dollar vigilante. This is just one of the only videos I saw when I was getting ready that was talking about this. And, th and it's not, this is what basically everybody is doing, but this is what I want to, I need to, I want to caution us, especially people like the dollar vigilante and people in the independent media, people that are arguably trying to fight for what they see as the truth, right? I mean, I, I, there's a lot of us out there that are, you know, having different paths, but fighting for the same ultimate thing. And what's the problem is that we get in this habit. Like for instance, if I would have seen that today, if I would have someone sent this to me and I would have hopped online and only looked at this one page where it says 2019 and not looked into the actual numbers and everything that's associated with it. And the fact that it goes back to 2017 and before and just came on and said, look, proof, right? They were, they were getting COVID-19 tests in 2019. How is that possible? We knew it and then move forward. That would have done nobody any justice. That would have done nobody any good. All it would have done was, I, I would argue, kind of scaring people, right? Now, here, now here, here's what he said in this. Just listen real quick. And uh, here's something interesting I saw. Here's a post from Alicia Johnson. Well, 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 look what we have here. 2018 COVID-19 diagnostic test kits. No, this wasn't planned whatsoever. So you can look at some of these images, and yet we... For the fact checkers, oh, I love the fact checkers. Thanks for checking your facts. Oh, thank you guys so much for not checking your facts because all I did is post to like CDC website, New York Times website, which is your guys' crap. I don't believe anything on there myself, but that's what they say. And here's from the World Bank's website. 
We'll have the link down below for all the fact checkers. I'm sure you're going to delete it anyway. But yeah, in 2018, it's still up on their site. It'll probably be gone as soon as enough people start talking about it. But there is something called Internet Archive, and you can go back and look. But it, as of right now, that info is still out there on their website that they were planning for. I very much, very much think he means well. For someone who said that in the chat. That's, I hope I made that clear in the beginning. I'm not trying to disparage at all. Like I said, this is like literally everybody doing, is the, this is how it's being reported today. And it is interesting, but it needs context, right? And that's what's important. For COVID, COVID's 19 test kits back in 2018. Very interesting stuff. In fact, I just found out about some more new information. And, and he goes on to the other point. Now, look, I, the reason I actually even showed you this one is because I think his coverage right there was better than 99% of everybody else because he didn't really try to influence your opinion except that the tweet that talked about it essentially did that for him. But that's that, that's why I showed that. Like, be clear, in no way am I trying to say that he did something wrong. My point is it's important that we flesh this out. And because look, there, there's definitely a benefit from an independent media standpoint to, you know, just kind of showing you something and going, hmm, that's pretty cool. And then just let, and you know, letting it proliferate for, uh, you, know, it, you know, and the point is that you maybe kind of know yourself that it's not as slam dunk as it may look. You know, the point is we need to continue to dive into this, right? And so at the end of the day, what that boils down to, to me, it's, it seems it seems pretty clear that that is something that dates back a long time ago and the and the and the actual numbers and associated materials they're using are there listed in other sites and past things from before now again I want to reassert that it doesn't mean it could, that I may not be having I may have the wrong assessment here maybe they're caught red-handed and maybe that is exactly that but it just doesn't seem to make sense and we just got to be logical about it so it's up there and the point is it's for you to look at and think about for yourself. But I don't want this to be jumped on. I I feel I'm suspicious about this. I, I we have to recognize that we've seen them continue to drop these things out, hoping that we grab them and then they go, oh, fake news, right? It's important to think about that. But I think that they're doing it intentionally. I definitely think that what they did was change this on purpose. I mean, we should if they if they come out and talk about this, we should ask the first thing we should ask. Why did you change a test kit that's used for more than COVID-19 to just COVID-19, right? I argue, I bought, nobody will ask that question because that was the setup. But uh, enough on this topic. Well, it's, I hope that you will continue to look into it. And funny, he mentions the fact checkers because that's where we're going to next. This ridiculous outlet, PolitiFact. And to be clear, <laughs> that was not me fact checking him. You know, that's, <laughs> the point was to try to help it flesh out a little bit more. Because I do think that's relevant, and I think it's interesting whether it shows you that they're trying to trick us into something because they're obviously in the middle of a dishonest ploy, the whole damn thing, or whether that was them just being incompetent and revealing something, which I just find impossible to believe, but it's possible. But here we are with the actual fact checkers, and they're nonsense. And I agree with them. They're nonsense. Like, what they're, 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 these fact checkers today are, are not even, like, they're barely even trying to pretend like they're fact checking. It's like all they're doing is just high-fiving political sides. Now, here's the point that we were already talking about. This is, can, if you can believe, the fact that what we were just talking about is now being fact-checked, but it's because of exactly what I was just referencing. Now, again, think of the point we're making with this topic, right? That we're, you know, at the end of the day, I, I just, we need to constantly try to be better than the mainstream media in every possible way and not fall into the same traps that they'd use, right? So here we are. And they're saying the CDC, quote, adjusted the U.S. COVID deaths from 153,000 to 9,210. That's the quote. And of course, the point is that that is fake because that is fake. That's not what happened. But you see what they're using this as is a, is a fake, is a, is a claim to say that this is fake. To say that the idea that only 6% of the deaths are only COVID is fake, and it's not fake. It's right here on the CDC website. But what they're doing is playing some, the same thing they always do. So instead of posing the thing and saying 6%, and here's what it means, and here's why they got it wrong, which is what they used to do, now they go, well, here, here's the thing we're saying is fake, just this quote, and then we're going to kind of very ambiguously write about the whole thing so you think all of it's fake, right? Because what they did 
was simply post what's already been there. That 6% of COVID deaths, only COVID was the mention. Only 6% of those, right? All, all of them, most of had to, the additional were 2.6 additional conditions or causes of death. Some of those could be pneumonia. Some of them could be poisoning and car accidents, right? So the point is that 94% of them might not be positive. You want my opinion? I think that the damn near vast majority, if not all of them, are not actually positive. But nonetheless, we can't say that only 9,210 are COVID positive because we don't know that. And that's not actually what they said. And what we do is give them the ammunition to keep people asleep. Now, if all of the independent media across the board had only come out and said exactly what they wrote and then they tried to do it, that would only help us. But because people actually said exactly what that says right there, and even with good intentions, even with saying it with when they're not realizing they're just feeding into something that was a misinterpretation of what they said, even if it ultimately ends up to be true, understand. Now, I know that's confusing for people. Even if that ends up being what actually is the truth, which again, I would not be surprised at all. I think that probably is more likely that than the other. But even if it ended up being true, it was still not the right thing to do to assume based on what they said. What we need to say is 94% of these people are likely not, that are, are questionable. It's my opinion that they're probably all false. That is an accurate way to say that. Now, as the fact, the fact checkers, as you can see, no, the CDC did not quietly adjust U.S. coronavirus deaths, right? Because they didn't quietly adjust anything. They just added a caveat in here. Now, I'm not defending CDC. I think it's just as absurd that they would just, you know, again, quietly post this down here, which you could say that because that's what happened. Like, this is, a, this is totally burying the lead, by the way, right? Just way down here. No one's going to read this. We're going to just, you know, way at the ball. Okay, here it is. So that, but they didn't quietly adjust anything. They simply just let us know about one of the metrics involved with these numbers, which is, this, which in my opinion is just as dishonest when you realize that number suggests that this is not what they're telling us it is. But when you say it like this, you give them that ammunition. And of course, Donald Trump plays his role as I see it and tweets it out. Claiming that CDC prevention, that, by the way, that's what PolitiFact is saying. I haven't even actually, I think it might be down here. No, they, I even, it wasn't relevant enough to me to the idea that whether or not he said that. The idea is that, they're, that, that their fact checking is doing this. But either, regardless, the point is they're claiming he said the CDC decreased the number of deaths. And that, whether he said it or there are plenty of other people online saying it, that's the problem. Because that is actually not true. They did not decrease the number of deaths. They just simply said that 94% of them have extra things, which in my opinion makes them questionable. But you see where I'm going with this. And this is the problem. And Trump plays his role by putting them out there. Then all of his supporters will jump on it and say he said it, so it must be true. And then you end up feeding into the two-party illusion, the two-party chaos that they want for the election. Now, the reason I bring this up to show it is because it's right here still, okay? It's right here. For 6% of the deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned. That is not fake news. That is not conspiracy theory. It is right on the CDC website. Updated most recently on September 2nd. Okay, now it also says, website. Updated most recently on September 2nd. Okay, now it also says, the deaths with conditions or causes in addition to COVID-19, on average, there were 2.6. So when they try to make it seem fake, what they do is they say people read that and think that is fake. They think this whole thing is fake and was never real to begin with. And they go on thinking we're in the middle of the worst pandemic in the history of the country, which is simply not true. Oh, and did I forget to tell you that they're, they're already telling you it's bad still, even though it's not. Right? At, think about how incredible it is. That we're at a point where we're finding out that most of the numbers are at the very least questionable, right? So it's possible that 90% of this isn't even there. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Then we also know of the false, every, every other aspect of the false positives and the, and the antibody test versus the antiviral test and the conflation of those and all the other things they've used to kick this up a notch. And yet we still saw the deaths completely disappear in most places, and we're clearly, and the, even the cases are only being hyped up by those tests we're talking about, and yet they still come out and say, guess what, we're predicting that 410,000 people in total will be dead by January 1st. <laughs> and they say, quote, the worst is yet to come. Don't worry, I know it seems like nothing's happening right now, but don't worry, you're all gonna die, so go back inside and wear your mask and goggles. It just, it's just incredible. I mean, it's the same thing with the story we're gonna get to in a moment, 
where they've got basically nothing happening and they go, well, don't, don't think we're out of the woods yet. So when are we out of the woods? If nothing's happening is not out of the woods, then what's out of the woods, right? It's, this is outrageous. It's about maintaining control. It says the model, of course, the model, right? Because we know how well those models worked out in the beginning, but here we are again, even though they turn out to be false and even though they keep getting caught lying and even though they keep getting caught manipulating everything from top to bottom, we have more models coming from the same people. Let's trust them. The model by this group, uh, the uh, IHME, I, I was looking at that earlier. What was that again? I just saw it. Anyway, I'm sure it will pop up down there. I, it, it, it talks about Johns Hopkins, but I think there's some another entity. But the model they're putting out, it is definitely another entity. I'm sure it's in there. The models they're putting out have previously been cited by the White House, they say, and state officials. What does that even mean? So because they've been stated, cited by the by officials, it means they're real? Well, that's what they want you to think. Right? You see what I'm saying? Like they don't say they say they're cited by the White House and state officials because that's supposed to give them a level of legitimacy. In fact, in my opinion, it makes it takes them in the exact opposite direction. But those very things cited by the White House and state officials have turned out to be wrong. But just because they say they were cited by them, we're supposed to go, ooh, this is probably real. It says forecast that the death toll will double by January 1st. So the death toll has all but stopped, but yet they're telling us it's going to double in the next couple of months, right up until the election, right? I mean, really? How can they possibly even justify that? And I'll tell you, when you go through this whole thing, you'll see that it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. But it says... Their assumptions, <laughs> don't you love that? A worst case scenario, best case scenario, and a mostly, so they give you three scenarios, each which have different numbers, but yet they sure as hell say, boom, that that's what's going to happen on the headline because that's all they want you to read. But they don't just say that. Now it says the U.S. will top more than 4,100, uh, 4, gosh darn it, 410,000 COVID-19 deaths by the end of the year as the country heads into the fall of winter according to a new forecast. But even that's not what they said. So they're just picking the middle one and they're saying that's what's happening according to them. But that's not what they said. They said that was seemingly the likely one with all of them. They, you know, you'll see. But it's just funny. I want you to see how the mainstream media wants you scared. They want you concerned. Now, of course, people who want to believe in them will argue they're doing it to keep you safe. But every time we look back, we find out that those scaremongering tactics turned out to be false. The numbers they cite, the conclusions they come to, they turn out to be hype and not real. But we just can't look back longer than one day. By the end of the year, they say we're all going to die, or 410,000, according to the Institute for Me Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. I believe that was it. Now it says COVID-19 has already killed at least 1,000... A shot of a gun. 186,800 people in the U.S. I don't know why I always do that. Now, get this. This is, I can't stand. The, so we're at a point where even the CDC has admitted that there's some caveats here, right? We've got the U.K. admitting their numbers have been greatly exaggerated. I mean, this is happening in every single scenario right now. It is coming out that these things are misrepresented. The next article will make that even more clear. And yet they still have the gall to continue to cite the numbers as if they're gospel and continue to use those numbers to put people, people in jail and to remove rights and to be violent. As they're telling you that, well, we're not sure though, but you better get back inside or you're going to go to jail. For your safety. It's unreal. And every time they do it, they're showing you that it's not about the numbers, not about safety. It's about control. It's about you doing what you're told. Now it says it could reach as high as 6,000... <laughs> good god 620,000 if states aggressively ease coronavirus restrictions and people disregard public health guidance so just basically be afraid and of course if you don't do what you're told it's going to be worse that's a foregone conclusion right guys it says in june except the fact that for all of us that did what we were told in plenty of the states that are the worst right now in this country it didn't really work out for them huh or how about you look at a place that did didn't get told to do anything like sweden that's way better but we're not supposed to talk about that. Now, in June, the IHME predicted that the death toll in the U.S. would reach 200,000 by October, which appears to be on track, they say. We'll see. Some epidemic, of course, these are numbers, again, that we admit, they admit are inaccurate, but we keep pushing it in. Some epidemiologists and mathematicians, however, have criticized them for making predictions too far into the future. Gee, I wonder why, because they keep getting it wrong. Now, it says they released three new projections, 
based on different assumptions. All of this is based on assumption of uh, by groups that have already gotten things wrong. But let's listen to them again, right? Same reason we should trust the people involved in that group that's creating, you know, saying that Iran and China are going to attack us, even though they've been caught lying about exactly that before. But yay, it all keeps going in the same direction. It's like we are literally schizophrenic in this country. It's like we cannot wrap our minds around the same thing. We Think of the actual definition of insanity. You're doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. We are all experiencing levels of insanity, it would seem. But they assumed. And there's a couple different predictions, all right? Generally 400,000, 600,000. The point being that if we don't do what we're told, it's going to keep getting worse. Government policies and compliance among the public will largely determine how many people die this fall and winter. Oh, it's going to be a dark winter, guys. They just keep telling us. Look, it says it right there. Oh, we're facing the prospect of a deadly December. It's so, it's joke. It's, it's a joke how obvious their propaganda and social engineering is. It's going to be a dark winter, guys. Mr. Mr. Oh, uh, shoot. Was it Pl um, Bright? Bright comes out and says, oh, it's going to be a dark winter. Dr. Robert Cadleck says it's going to be a dark winter. He says it again recently. It's going to be a dark winter. We have people saying it's going to be a dark couple, a dark few weeks. It's going to be a deadly December. They're constantly berating you with social engineering. You, It's going to be bad once winter comes. They keep telling you that. That's the plan, apparently. But they're telling you, if you don't do what you're told, it's going to be even worse. So they're telling us no matter what we do, apparently, it's going to be bad. Do you not get that? They don't, it's the second pandemic. It's coming, guys. So what about all the measures that are being taken? That doesn't do anything, apparently. That just going to happen, guys. It's coming. Now, it says, on a call, Murray added that widespread mask use likely won't be enough to drive down spread of the virus in the fall and winter. Think about that. So they're screeching about how this is what we have to be doing. As the end all, right? If you can't do, if you can't social distance, you just have to wear a mask. But that apparently won't do it, he says. He said the question from a policy perspective is what kind of social distancing restrictions will be most effective. So he's basically saying right there for you to see, and this is happening across the board slightly so you can tell, that they're slightly starting to kind of pull back on this and say, well, it's all of it. As I keep, as I've been telling you since the beginning, even the studies they point to, they conflate hand washing, social distancing, and masks for the most part. Which, of course, because those are the things that are having an effect. If you're not near anybody, well, you're not going to get sick. But then they just make that, make the mask make sense too. But he's literally telling you right there. He's saying that it's about social distancing, right? If we can keep everybody away from everybody else, then we'll be good. But wear a mask too. But he says it right in the beginning. Mask won't be enough. I know that's not the slam dunk that people, and I agree. There, that I should, I, it's, I've made it clear on this show. But for him to step into it and stay was away from it and say, well, it's about the social distancing. That's him saying in a way that masks aren't the focus and aren't what we need to be focusing on because it's not doing anything. It's actually hurting people. That's my opinion. And the science is backing up my opinion, but you know how it goes. It says daily new cases, and to be very clear, just so I constantly reassert this, as I have ever said from the very beginning, all the science, outside of the meta-analysis, which is really looking over the same science and just coming to a different conclusion, and it's, that's not politicized at all in the middle of a pandemic, but they come to the conclusion that they're not mask-wearing. Mask is not, does not show a statistically significant difference in regard to transmission. They're now finding out that N95s possibly are even worse because of the way that the, the fitting and the fact that the, the vents possibly don't work sometimes and on and on and on. As well as the fact that cloth masks, which are being recommended to everybody, increase your risk of influenza-like illness or infection in general because they're wet. I mean, it goes on and on. Pretty damn ridiculous. Now it says... Daily new cases in the U.S. have fallen since they peaked in late July at more than 70,000 per day. Again, just reasserting these as if we haven't demonstrated that there's an obvious issue there. However, daily new cases appear to have uh, uh, plateaued again at over 40,000 new cases per day, a level of pervasive spread that top health officials have said is worrying heading into the fall, dark winter, guys, based on numbers that we know are inaccurate, despite the drop in new cases. While they're hyping cases, think about that, while they're you know, padding the numbers, they're even dropping. The numbers of deaths caused by COVID-19 every day in the U.S. has remained high at nearly 1,000 per day. I wonder why. According to the new data compiled by Johns Hopkins University, which has been involved with this from the beginning. That, the title should just be, be afraid. You're all going to die. That's what it should say. That, that is the sentiment that they're spreading there. Now, I want to reassert this 
because it's incredibly important. And it has to do with the same idea about this 6% discussion. But RT, and ra rather more specifically, the, uh, the author of this article, really r nailed this, articulated this very, very well. Up to 90% of people who test positive for COVID barely carry any virus and are not contagious. Every stat about the disease is bogus. Now, I, I would argue that maybe that statement is, a, you could argue that that is not necessarily entirely accurate. I would argue there's probably a lot of staff that aren't entirely, you know, but nonetheless, I'm just picking, pick, you know, nitpicking. The bottom line is the 90% aspect. And this is, in, they did a really good job on this article and breaking down what, this is what I've been saying, but I think this was put together well. It has been revealed that the standard, the standard tests being used in the U.S. to diagnose COVID-19 cases are far too sensitive. Again, which, which by the way, John Rappaport's been writing, which is why I knew this from the very beginning. With the vast majority of people marked down as being positive, actually turning out to be negative. It turns out that tests that deliver, and again, this is, they're saying a vast majority, which by the way, I agree with, but that's not a definitive number, right? If they had, if they had said 94% of them turn out to be negative, I would disagree with that because we can't prove that, right? You get the point. I made this before, but I, that I'm, the reason I'm reasserting it as much as plenty of people can't stand how I repeat myself, but I do it for a very deliberate reason. It's important that we recognize that. And it's important that we're better than them. Now, it turns out that tests that deliver a simple binary positive or negative result are not fit for purpose. You know, sort of like the creator of the full thing said, you know, um, uh, shoot, Mollus, Kerry Mollus, I think. I'm, I might be remembering the name wrong. As they tell us nothing about the contagiousness of each person. Yep, that's the whole point. Because they might have a little bit of something in there, but not actually be contagious or ever transmissible. Now, it says data from three U.S. states, New York, Nevada, Massachusetts, show that when the amount of virus found in a person is taken into account, up to 90% of people who have been tested positive should actually be negative. Now, that's a separate concept, as they are carrying only tiny amounts of the virus. Think about that. And not contagious, pose no risk to others, and have no need to isolate. Now, remember that this is what the actual writer of the author said, uh, article said. Right? The author of the New York Times article herself said that 90% of these people don't need to isolate. So that's not fake news. That's not an extrapolation of some claim made by CDC. That is a direct quote of the person who did the research. Now, that, that is coming from the group who's being cited for this. Now, it says this means that only a fraction of the daily cases being reported so hysterically in the mainstream media are actually bona fide COVID-19 sufferers and need treatment and, separate, and, to, and to separate themselves from others. Right, so th that is, I remember I showed you the tweet when I talked about this first, directly from the author. Now, how in the world can we be in a position where that's being stated, and yet we're that their government is still pushing in these? As of this very moment, the media and the government at large are still stating these things as if they're fact. That's schizophrenic. I mean, that's actually insane. We're watching this play out, and it's this is going to make people's brains explode. Now it says, how could this have happened? The answer has to do with the sensitivity of the PCR test, the polymer, uh, polymerase chain reaction, the test for COVID, which we know, this, which it turns out can be ramped up according to the taste of the testing companies. I didn't actually know this nuance. I mean, I understood this is how it works, but when you dive into how and the numbers, I found this to be incredibly relevant. And so will you, I assume. It says most testing companies have chosen the outrageous, chosen is important, the outrageously high sensitivity limit of 40 PCR cycles, meaning that the DNA in a sample is expo exponentially increased 40 times in order to amplify its signal. So the, the companies themselves are choosing the level. Now, you can clearly see that that could be influenced in a number of ways, whether from political entities controlling them or from them, they themselves wanting to be seen as the test that works better because obviously the point was to see positives, right? And that's why we had all the hospitals lie about the positive, the po the uh, was the positive rate. They they were saying the, the test positivity is what it's called, saying you know that we have a ninety nine percent positivity rate when really it was six percent, which most of them turned out to be lying. That was the, the media didn't even touch that. They overtly lied to you. I mean, the point was they wanted you to think that most people testing were showing positive, when in reality, 6% of them were testing positive. And even those could have been false positives. 90 and think about how crazy that is. 
And they're changing this number because it increases the possibility of positive tests. It says, but using such a ridiculously sensitive test means that the faintest traces of a, vi of a dead virus or even leftovers from previous infections can result in a positive. Oh, such as how they said, oh, well, if you have the cold or that might show as a positive. Remember that? That was them admitting that they knew this was happening. They knew it was too sensitive and they knew it was testing for people, things that weren't even there. Or, you know, in regard to COVID-19, that you're basically positive because you had the cold. Now, it says Professor Juliet Morrison, a University of California virologist, said that even a limit of 35 PCR cycles is too high, let alone 40. She said she was, quote, shocked that people would think that 40 could represent a positive. But apparently, pretty much everyone in the U.S. COVID brain trust took exactly that on faith. Like, think about th this is the expert, right? These are the experts. So ask yourself, who are the people that are that are trotting out on, on Fox and CNN to talk about these things, right? She's saying this as, and again, remember the guy I told you who was using PCR tests in regard to muscles and found and was early on saying these are cr incredibly false positives all the time. They have a use, which he needed, but they were he, the, he had to ma factor in the false positives. And here's another person going, I can't believe they would do this. Like, it's common knowledge that that's too high. And it is. That's the point. So where are all the experts? Oh, that's right. They're being censored when they speak up. You're only getting to see the chosen experts by the technocratic control elite, right? Now it says the FDA has only now, and this is incredible, the FDA has only now been forced to concede that they have no idea how different testing companies determine which the positive and negative tests are. They just accept whatever data they're given. Doesn't that sound great? The FDA, Federal Drug Administration, is supposed to be, you know, but nope, they're not even, they're not, they're not even looking past the, the companies who have a profit motive, who have money on the mind, who have, who have shareholders, are sending data to the FDA, who is supposed to be watching out for you, and they just blindly take that at face value. Checks and balances, guys. Fantastic. Maybe because there's an obvious agenda playing out right in front of us. Just sickening. It says, what these findings bring is absolute assurance that testing to this point has been an utter waste of time. And that not, and I think that is incredibly intentional. Right? We didn't, they didn't want to do it at the beginning. I think there's an obvious reason because you would have found out that it was all through this country. Then they rush out as much as they can using these tests, which they, I argue, knew would be a huge false positive. And now we're seeing a restriction. We're again seeing them pull back and trying to delay testing. And I think there's an obvious reason for that because they've already gotten what they need. They're, ju they're just hoping we're scared enough to listen to them. Now it says, is an absolute assurance that testing to this point has been another waste of time and that not one statistic, not one concerning this pandemic, from cases to deaths to infection rates can be believed. And I 100% agree with that. To what degree? We don't know. But the fact that we know for sure that every aspect of this is, is there's a caveat, a question. We, they simply cannot use these things against you, but they are. As it says, a bit of common sense would have been enough. Seemingly, the only time we even heard the term common sense was in regard to something that was the opposite of common sense. Of course, that's the mass we're talking about, but nobody else wants to apply this common sense anywhere else says it's a virus so deadly that you need a test to tell you whether or not you have it. I heard that a long time ago, actually, and I forgot. I think that's hilarious. I mean, it's, it's a quip. It's a joke. But really take a moment and think about that. This is supposed to be, as we're told, the most violent, the most deadly pandemic. No, Trump keeps out. Nobody could have seen this. Oh, it's just so crazy, right? And yet everyone needs to be tested so we know if we're sick or not. I mean, doesn't that, that is the dumbest thing. When I read that, I was like, that is hilarious, but very saddening. A virus so deadly, you need the test to tell you whether or not you have it. Now it says not, not even a particularly dangerous particle. The latest data show that it is the eighth most common cause of death in England, and it doesn't make the top 10 in Wales. Yep, you heard that correctly, guys. Monthly mortality analysis, England and Wales, July 2020. This is ridiculous. It, the leading causes of death in July 2020. So arguably right in the middle of this. 
The leading causes of death in these areas were dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which by the way, Alzheimer's is caused, is one of the leading causes of death. And that's caused by like things like aluminum, barium in the air. Yeah. Nobody's doing that. Right. But it says in England and, uh, I, uh, ischemic heart disease in Wales. Okay. So COVID-19 is not the causing leading cause of death, causing death, not even top. Okay. So how is that even possible? How can these countries right now be closing these places down like we're in the middle of the worst pandemic in history, and yet that's not even, it wasn't even the leading cause of death. People are dying from normal things that have been happening before this, more so than this big dangerous pandemic disease? Please explain that for me. In England, in July 2020, the coronavirus was the eighth most frequent underlying cause of death. The eighth in England. What? What? Accounting for 2.6% of the deaths of only 976, by the way. In Wales, COVID-19 did not feature in the top 10 leading causes of death. Now, this is not a full picture, so we're clear. It's obviously talking about a small window. But think about how crazy that is that we can even be in a position at any point during this pandemic where it's, it's the eighth leading cause of death. And that country has shut everything down. Their economy has been shut down. Their jobs have been destroyed. The entire world has been shut down in order to stop that. That appears to be an illusion to me. I don't know about you. And, you know, speaking of illusions and speaking of the fact that there's a huge, obvious psychological burden this is being put on, on that's being put on everybody. And I definitely think that's part of it. I mean, th before I even go into it, think about the thing we talked about last, or not last, but in the past about mass shootings. Right? The idea of the government telling you that, you know, might is right, that military, right, that destroying lives and bombing countries and starving entire nations to death is altruistic. It's fighting for freedom, right? It's the good people do these horrible things, right? Think about how counterintuitive that is. And the fact that that is now bleeding into what we are. That's why you have people that are, you know, if, if it's actually a real one, jumping up and shooting people or doing these things because they've been told that violence is the answer. Might is right, right? If you're strong enough, you take it, right? That's what our government's telling us today. As well as the fact that they're telling us these things that don't make sense, right? In your in our minds, they're telling us that we that we should be killing these people, right? That we that we should be doing these things for your benefit. But at the end of the day, they're all restrictive and authoritarian. It is causing minds to shatter. People can't take this stuff and their minds are splintering. And now we're dealing with this today more than I think we've ever seen. And it's exactly what people warned about, in including Donald Trump, by the way. He made this claim right when this started, that there will be these kind of repercussions. It says long COVID when the symptoms don't stop. Oh, okay. So now we're at a point where they're going, uh-oh, uh-oh. Well, these people are getting sick and I know it wasn't that bad. I know it was just a, some sniffles and, and some, you know, pneumonia or whatever. But guess what? It looks like it goes on for a really long time. So this is more nuanced than we thought. And we need to be, right? It's, this is where it's going. It says, for some sufferers, a couple of weeks of a COVID infection are just the beginning. Months later, they still have a range of symptoms, often including anxiety and depression. <laughs> Or maybe it's because their life has been destroyed and they're in the middle of a destroyed economy and they can't go out and they have to wear a mask and they're all being, I mean, that is the dumbest thing. I mean, look, look I'm not even, I, the point is it could be sure. Why not? People could have symptoms far after this, but realize what they're saying. Just like everything anywhere at any point was possibly a COVID symptom. Well, now if you just feel unhappy after this, well, it's not because of your government's restrictions. It's because you're still sick. Oh, okay. Isn't that convenient? But the point is not to say that that's how, I, mean, I think that's absurd. And I think that part of that is them just lying about things that are happening. But I also want you to consider this aspect. As John asks, how many people have psychological COVID? Think about that. Like really think about what that means. Not just, you know, that they got themselves sick because of it, which is possible too. Because you can manifest real things based on your emotional state and your psychological state. Okay, so it's possible that people could be worked up into such a frenzy, like people that are, you know, uh, um, gosh, I'm blanking on words today. A, you know, people that are concerned about the smallest little things, I think are going to get sick by ever the, uh, not a, shoot, I hate when I can't remember words, but the point is, uh, as a, a um, an affliction where people are, you know, they look up things online and they, th ah, I have that, I must have that. God, I know that word, I can't, have, I can't stand that. But this is the same thing that people could literally be actually feeling psychological effects like having the sniffles or getting sick because they believe that they might be getting sick, right? That's real. 
But on top of that, which that would count as psychological COVID, but thank you, hypochondriac. Thank you, Kevin. Ah, I hate when I can't remember stuff. But the point is not just real things, but even fake. Like, I mean, not fake, but not actually happening in the real world, right? Like, so you believe that you're sick because you're depressed, because you keep thinking you feel something in your chest. Oh, no, suddenly I feel like I can't breathe properly, you know, but you're, it's just you. Your mind is playing tricks on you, and suddenly you call your doctor, and my chest hurts, and suddenly a contact tracer comes out, and suddenly, yo, we just, well, you're sick, and you've got the sniffles all, then you're sick, and you're quarantined. Did it even happen? You know, they test, they test negative, just like that guy did, and they still, well, we don't know for sure, because they're also admitting they don't know for sure based on their own tests when they want to, and they go, oh, we're going to keep you anyway, just in case. How many people right now across this country are actually just feeling that they're sick or, or assuming that what they have, likewise, that's a cold or pneumonia or anything else is just COVID because they think they have it, right? We have to consider that as a huge portion of this. And then how many of them go and get tested and get test positive anyway, because there's so many test positives. This is a perfect storm for creating exactly what they need to justify their agendas. But where have we heard that before? And that's not like the U.S. government has ever done exactly that over and over and over and over throughout our history. Of course not. Here's Andrew Cuomo just, you know, telling you what to think, right? Masks work, period. Climate change is real, period. Vaccines are effective, period. Trust scientists, period. That's it, right? Because that was necessary. Like, think about how gross that is. Like, I'm not saying because it's you know, people who believe those things. That's not, I'm not even saying that those things are wrong, which I disagree with pretty much all of them. My point is to just come out and state it. I mean, in itself, that's, that's social engineering. But I mean, let's just take one of them, for example. Trust scientists? What does that make you think of? What about, you know, believe women? Uh-oh. What about that one? Oh, I guess that counts up until Biden gets accused and then we forget about it, right? It's the same stupid nonsense. Like, why would you ever just blindly trust scientists? Are you telling me that every possible scientist anywhere is a hero? That every scientist that ever existed was a good person? Or we won't believe that some of them might be you know, profiteering bad people that are sociopaths that only care about their own agendas and are willing to lie in order to get contracts and, and grants. You know, it's so dumb for people like this to act like we should just blindly assume that we should just trust scientists because they're doing the right thing. Like, what are we, six years old? I mean, that's just dumb. I mean, especially even like vaccines are effective. So, so, you, so you could argue that some of them are. You could even argue that all of that most of them are. I disagree with that. But you can't just blanket say that they are effective because they're not all effective. People have been hurt by them, right? Or I mean, it just, it's just so stupid that they can keep putting these things out there and asserting them aggressively. And then if you respond weirdly, you know, even even rightly so as a human being who has you know, agency of their own thoughts to say, well, I don't know, I think some scientists, I mean, what about the scientists that work for the Nazis? What about them? Oh, so, whoosh, they, came, they became NASA, so let's forget about that. But well, what about any other group of scientists that we at one point were bad guys? Were we supposed to trust them too? Oh, I guess there's a caveat there. Oops, he didn't include that, right? It's just, it's, it's childish mentality. They're trying to brainwash you. It's the same thing. I drove by somebody's yard the other day and they had a sign in their yard that said, it said, thank our care, our, our health care heroes. And I thought to myself, so what are you saying that because of COVID-19 now all healthcare workers are heroes or were they heroes before this and you just forgot to thank them then? Okay. Or what about the fact that now, like, what about that person who just lied and, you know, who, who committed malpractice? Is that person also still a hero? Or what about the person who, you know, was giving old patients morphine so they died because they were a sociopath? Is that person a hero? Well, you just said our healthcare workers are heroes. So how does that work? Right? I'm just playing, I'm playing a game here. The point is obviously people that put their lives on the line in any sense to help others are good people and should be recognized. But to just blanket say that we should just all, you know, it's the same stupid thing as at the time of saying, believe women. So no woman could lie. And we're just supposed to blindly take any acclaim that's made by a woman because believe women. Well, at the time, damn right. If you challenged that, you were a misogynistic, bad person. Well, obviously it was childish and dumb. Some women you should believe people based on the information, based on their character, right? Make your own decision individually based on the individual, not just blindly trust people because they're a certain gender. But here's where we are in the same scenario. This is what they want you to think. So you should, not all healthcare workers are heroes. 
Some of them are really bad at their job. Some of them make mistakes and hurt people. So it doesn't mean that they should be all bad people either, but you should be able to choose as a discerning adult based on the individuals in front of you. Not just go, scientist, good. You know, healthcare workers, hero. Like, that's just stupid. And I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of the mindless following. Of course, going into the same discussion in regard to vaccines, it's happening there as well. And this is a really interesting development. Exclusive. Some states won't distribute a Trumpian half-baked COVID vaccine. Now, first of all, this is interesting because anyone anywhere can see that this thing is dangerous, that it's been rushed out in a way that's unprecedented, that's not being tested like normal. I mean, and they claim they're going to make sure it's effective and safe before they put it out, but that we, how many times have they said that in the past and lied? Maybe not this exact administration, but people involved in this administration, people like Robert Cadleck. Well, I should say specifically, maybe not Trump himself, but people that, but yes, this administration, people like Robert Cadleck, people involved in these things that have 100% said, yeah, it's totally safe. And not, and knowing that it wasn't people, that's, that's the guy involved with this, the, the strategic national stockpile right now, the assist, the, the, uh, the, a, the ASPR for health and health human services. So we should have, we have every reason to be concerned about this, but the way that they're selling this is as if it's Trump's vaccine. So what I believe this is meant to do is drive Trump supporters into blindly supporting the vaccine. Because, I mean, look, think about how interesting it is. What they're talking about, some states are obviously Rep uh, Democrat states. You see it right here, California, New York, Washington. So the point is that what they're trying to suggest to you is that, well, the Democrats don't believe that Trump's taking the safety measures that are required. Except the fact that they're the very entity, by and large, that's ag aggressively pushing the vaccine. The very same one, mind you. All of the left media, all of it. I mean, even the, even Fox is doing it too. They are all pushing this vaccine. So this is, in my opinion, a ploy meant to drive people into supporting it because they're saying, well, it's Trump's. And so they're going to go, well, if Trump did it, then it must be good. And we believe in Trump. So no, you can't stop it. You're going to stop. You got to let the American people have his Trump's vaccine, right? That's that's the ploy. I personally believe that even most Trump supporters or even, I, I shouldn't say it like that. Because what I mean when I say that is people caught in the two-party paradigm. I should say even people caught in two-party paradigm are smarter than that and would see it. That's my belief. But we'll see what happens. It's an interesting ploy, but I also want to make a point before I go into the article to think about this. How many times have I made the point that I think Donald Trump at this moment not only has the right, but the obligation to stand up and say that what's happening in this country is unconstitutional. If you, I mean, his supporters right now will tell you, if you talk to any one of them, that Trump knows, secret, wink, wink, he knows the masks don't work, and he knows this is fake, and he knows the lockdowns are bad. He's letting the Democrats hang themselves, even though there's Republicans doing it too, and blah, 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 whatever. That's what they would believe, right? So I, what I keep saying is, well, if Trump actually wanted to stop this, he could right this moment. He has every right under the Constitution to stop these unconstitutional acts. In fact, that is his obligation as president, but he's not. They would argue then that he's waiting because the election's coming. And so he can't do it now because they would attack him. Well, that's fine if you want to believe that, but that is suggesting that he is willing to take political benefit in order to, you know, over helping Americans, allowing them to suffer until November and then we'll maybe help them, right? Like that's, that's crazy. That's politics. But in this event with this article, ask yourself if up until now, Trump is saying, well, I can't do anything. It's all up to the governors, even though it's ridiculous and he has every right to stop what they're doing because it's unconstitutional. Imagine when this swings around, and I know it's a little bit ahead, but I'm just trying to call it out. Like This is what I feel might be coming. And suddenly Trump stands up and says, no, you have to deliver the vaccine because it's for everybody's safety. Now, what will happen then when he jumps over states' rights to force that in? I'm, that, this is way down the line. I'm just saying hypothetically, when that happens, That'll be an important moment. Now, remember what I said back in the day when Trump doesn't stop all these things? Will all the Trump supporters stand up and realize, well, we're here now and they don't. Okay. So it's the same point I made then. And I'm just hopefully trying to jerk some more people free while it's happening. If they allow these things to continue, we need to see that they're part of this. I said that right when this started and all the poor supporters I talked to said, you'll never let it happen. And here we are. Sure. You can blame the Democrats, but it's still happening, Right. So I think it's interesting. So keep that in mind when we get there. And remember that he was saying, states' rights, I can't do anything. But then when it comes around and that may get forced, which is what I think might happen, that's contradicting that claim, showing you that it always could have been stopped from the beginning. Now it says, officials from, from at least three states have suggested they would refuse it. I don't think they will. 
I mean, unless that second part ends up being the ploy. Again, this is just hypothetical assumptions and making points that apply to larger situations anyway. But I kind of don't think they're going to refuse it because I think this is the ploy I said at the beginning to kind of just drive people to support it. Because get this, if, if we get enough, if they get enough people supporting a vaccine, so enough people take the vaccine, which is ultimately what they want, they don't need to do anything else. So I think they will try that first. But they've suggested they won't take it because they believe it's not received adequate vetting by the federal government. Now, that's dumb because I don't think the federal government cares at all about these vaccines. They put out countless times in the past of vaccines and th rushed out flu vaccines and swine flu and, and anthrax and all these different ones that they knew were unsafe and untested. Knew it. Not just not tested, but knew that they were. I mean, that's incredible. So let's not pretend like they care at all about this. But the point is... Whether, who, whether we're talking about who doesn't care about it, we have to all agree that it is absolutely something that's being rushed out that's not very safe. Something that has a genetically altering vaccine that's not even really medicine. It's changing your body to be able to, they claim, effectively fight off the virus itself. And that's the, not how the vaccine works. This is genetically altering your body to respond a different way to, the vac to when the virus enters your body. A vaccine normally puts in the back part of the virus into you so it creates antibodies to fight out the virus, which basically triggers your body's own response. This is changing your body's response. Think about the possible repercussions of that. We've never done this before. So when they say that, we all should go, yeah, this seems very dangerous, but don't think of it in a partisan way. That's what they want. California, New York, Washington, all pretending like they're not going to take it. States refusing to distribute a vaccine raises the prospect of an unprecedented clash between a federal government acting to aid Trump politically and states with public health concerns about the vaccine approval process. That whole sentence was very partisan. The article, the writer of the article, making stating the prospect of an unprecedented clash between a federal government acting to aid Trump politically. You know, is that the assumption? Maybe, but I don't think that's a foregone conclusion. There's plenty of entities in the federal government that I argue are not trying to help him politically. So, you know, I hate the way they try and insert that. Anyway, it says HHS Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, Michael Caputo, so another Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary, told the outlet we're talking, we're reading from here now, after publication that, quote, any suggestion that the FDA would prematurely authorize a COVID-19 vaccine is irresponsible and undermines confidence in our public, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because we've never done that before, right? I mean, <laughs> that's what's so dumb. They stand up with their righteous indignation and, wow, how dare you say that we would do what we've done many times before? How dare you? Like, it's just so, it's so funny. And they must know. I mean, and that's their job. Their job is to sell you on the confidence, right? They're confidence men. You know the term for that? con man. That's what it is. Quote, data is driving the development of all COVID-19 vaccines and countermeasures. And the administration has made it abundantly clear that any vaccine distributed to the American people will be head to the FDA's gold standard. Oh, you mean like the one you applied with the anthrax vaccine or the one you applied with the swine flu or the swine flu before that, or the one, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, the gold standards worked out real well. It's that gold standard you choose to completely ignore whenever it benefits you or probably is not even there at all. Now it says Centers for Disease Control Director Robert Redfield sent a letter last week to governors demanding they ensure vaccine distribution sites be fully operational by November 1st. That's where that, that was where that began, right? So what are we talking about here? I mean, you cannot miss the political insinuation there. To have it ready by November, is it just coincidence? We're just supposed to assume that it was November 1st, just worked out right before the election? Come on. I mean, it's crazy obvious how this is being played out. And I think this is meant to drive up partisan arguments. I mean, here's what Trump actually tweeted. Remember, I talked about this. This is so clearly, and this is so clumsy. This is, the, this is one of the clumsiest propaganda tweets Trump's ever put out. The deep state, or, or whoever, right, right? I didn't mean to go to the next page. The deep state, or, or whoever. What does that even mean? Just own it, man. If you're going to just, I mean, that's, that is, that is so you have that ambiguity and be like, well, I didn't really, I just was being, I was being funny. I was playing a joke or blah, 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 blah. What you wanted was for people to take the hint, which wasn't even much of a hint and just be like, oh, he's insinuating the deep state is who his supporters believe are after him are trying to stop the vaccine. So suddenly you've got all these people who are, uh, you know, people who are by and large suspicious about this vaccine right? It's very easy to see who are now possible, who are being engineered even by Trump to supporting the vaccine. 
right? Because of the deep state's trying to stop his vaccine, well, of course, then his supporters are going to be behind it because that's the ba- bad deep state and Trump good, so vaccine good, right? When you get reduced down to this very, you know, reductive narrative, that's what happens. But that's exactly the point. He's trying to drive you into believing that. Now, it says, meanwhile, officials with Operation Warp Speed, a joint health and human services DOD effort to accelerate vaccine development, sounds safe, have promised to overwhelm the airwaves with vaccine-related messaging by early November. So propaganda. The final measure of whether any COVID-19 vaccine can be trusted boils down to whether the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee is consulted on its approval at the federal level. Again, so even the article is saying, well, as long as the FDA says it's okay, well, no, no. They they have got they have done this over and over in the past. Them saying it's good means absolutely nothing if history is any indication. But let's let's just only think about it in a partisan divide and not consider that they're all trying to get you to in one way or another go into taking something like this and and giving your consent to the new system. By all means, jump right into the illusion. And here is even a local outlet telling you flat out, local municipalities can make COVID-19 vaccine mandatory. Oh, you mean that thing that the blue checks keep telling you is a fake news story? Yeah, well, it, it, despite the fact that there are about every inst- government around, I mean, all the local entities around the country seemingly are screaming about how we have a right to make it mandatory. Or Virginia is going to make it mandatory. We're going to force this. But then we talk about it and that's fake news. They fall all over themselves to say, that's not real. You misunderstand it. And it's just, it's, it's obnoxious and it is tiresome, which is the point. Now, this is really irritating. I don't even want to go through this anymore because I had it all highlighted and they refreshed the page like all garbage mainstream memes does today. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you get the point. There was one point that I thought I wanted to include, but of course, it looks like they actually added, and this is the point, guys. When they refresh these articles, they're changing things. That's why it says updated right there. But of course, they don't put a caveat. They don't add anything. They don't say down here, here's what we changed. Here's what it used to say. You know, like they're journalistically obligated to. Yeah, they don't do that anymore because they're not journalists anymore. Who knows what they changed, right? I mean, I don't even see the part that I was going to find before. Like they probably removed stuff and changed it for the exact reason for things that I was going to point out. Anyway, God, it's frustrating. The point is they're very clearly telling you, look, we can make this mandatory. Gosh darn it. I wanted to see that. There was at least three or four things that I had highlighted in here that were important to point out. Well, here's an important one. The 10th Amendment plays a big role here. They're talking about states' rights. I, I'm telling you guys, I'm that is what this is going to become. That is going to be turned into that argument. And I feel like it's going to go the way that I, I considered. But they're already giving you the thought. The, the, the states' rights discussion has a big... But you, that, that's not how this goes. As always, if it is a violation of your rights, just because the state, 10th Amendment says the states have rights to do these, to do actions, doesn't then give them the right to violate other constitutional rights, right? You see that? That's a joke. It's a fallacy. You have a right in many different ways to not have your body violated. You don't have the right, they don't have the right to force these things on you. Even if there's a precedent of Supreme Court, which is what this article talks about, it's right here, the same one that Dershowitz points out. It doesn't change anything because as I keep pointing out, anything anything that is repugnant to the Constitution is null and void. That, was an, or that has been a precedent for a long time. So every time they pass a law or rule on something that goes against the Constitution, which is the core value document of this country, it is then null and void. Doesn't mean they're not going to enforce it. Doesn't mean we don't have a rogue government that's constantly doing that. But we need to understand that. So when they try to force things on you, it's unconstitutional. There, hence, it is null and void. Okay. So we find ourselves here as they're stress- stressing the Tenth Amendment idea. Well, that sets up this argument where they're going to try to either refuse it because they think it's dangerous or force it on you, and it's going to play this game back and forth. It becomes a partisan divide instead of realizing that your government is the problem. As was always the case. But he says, I, th- I think simply stating I don't believe in vaccinations, I don't want to get it, I never received them before, I don't think that will necessarily equate to an exemption under these ordinances. Yeah, they very clearly changed up this entire article. It said, it's stated as a matter of fact that they were saying that we have every right to make this mandatory. But that's, that's why this is what the title says, right? That's what it says right there. But it looks like you won't be able to find anywhere where they say that anymore. This is the epitome of mainstream media today. 
God, that bothers me. But you guys are all here. You know the point. You know the truth. But to finish with a really ridiculous point before we get into foreign policy, all lined up in the same point here, mask up and shut up. No, this is not a parody. This is mainstream media telling you exactly what is going to happen. Exactly what, just like we've already seen, every time the mainstream media comes out with their new little kick in the right direction, the little boiling frog, another totalitarian tiptoe, it ends up happening. And as we point to it and they go, oh, that's so, you're, they're just hypothetical, don't die, blah, blah, blah. And then it happens. And no one swings back around and says, oh, we were wrong, our fault. Probably because all of them were blue check manipulators and just trying to change opinions. COVID-19 transmission would go up if we spoke less or less loudly in public spaces. Why aren't more people saying so? Isn't that a stupid comment? I mean, I think he's trying to be cheeky there. But isn't that dumb? Like, you're literally saying if we talked less, it would be bad. Why aren't people talking? That's what it says. I mean, it's almost like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm picking, I'm splitting hairs. I just, as a writer, I'm just kind of like, that's just stupid. But Derek Thompson, don't forget the person's name. Don't forget the face. This is a writer of propaganda. This is a person that you should never, ever, ever listen to for the rest of your life. It says, COVID-19 researchers have rightly extolled, you know, praised the virtues of masks, hailed the necessity of ventilation, and praised the, soli the, the solitary nature of outdoor activities. God, that's disgusting. Like, you're a little, little hubris there, huh? Who's, who has praised the virtues of masks? Really? I mean, there, people have told, pe people are arguing that they have an effect, and then people are talking about the science. People who have praised the, the virtue of masks are bad people. Of course, the idea that the, the, any, the virtue of masks at all is even a discussion. I mean, he can't even get through the first sentence without drooling propaganda. The virtues of masks. So it means you're a good person when you wear a mask. Did you get that? Gross. When he says, but, and I'm not even saying gross because I disagree with the mask. I'm saying that's gross no matter what he's trying to sell you on. He's trying to socially engineer you into believing that it makes you a better person when one, you do what you're told, and two, that when you just wear a mask. Who cares about what it means or what it does? Just do it because you're a good person. That's government manipulation. It says, but another behavioral tactic hasn't received enough attention in part because it's ma it makes itself known by its absence. That tactic is silence. Now, I hope it's not lost on anybody, the the uh, alarming level of, of social engineering that's happening here, telling you, like, I mean, like the science telling you to look away from each other when you walk past each other. They're actually telling you now to just not talk. Sit down, be quiet, do your job, don't speak. Just be there, be the workers that we trained you to be. Now it says, yet it is finally time to talk in this pandemic about the importance of not talking in the pandemic. Every route of viral transmission would go down if we talked less or talked less loudly in public spaces, according to a professor. This is just a very clear fact. It's not controversial, of course. And no one disagrees with that. But here's what is controversial, right? I mean, okay, of course, not talking would clearly end this, but so would living in a cardboard box the rest of your life. But you know what's controversial? Advocating for it. That's what's controversial. Advocating for people to just simply not talk to each other. That's what's controversial. Of course, we can say the less you talk, it would probably lessen the disease because it wouldn't spread or so on. That's assuming that's even really there. The point is that when you then say this is what we should be doing, you all should stop talking. And if you're talking too loudly, well, you're a bad person. That's that is what's controversial. And that is what makes these people disgusting because they are doing that in this article. So, of course, of course, we can argue that obvious things. If you didn't go see anybody for the rest of your life, well, of course, you would never even have a chance to spread anything. But advocating for never seeing anybody for the rest of your life is just stupid. But so is this. Now, it says masks block them from our mouths and noses. So let's read the whole paragraph. This you're, you'll, this is I can't I, it's in their fervor to try to rush to, you know, to sell you on the narratives. They even get it wrong. I love it. It's, it's, I hope you, they, it's just, it doesn't matter because people that want to defend the mask one way or the other, well, they'll, def, they'll find a way to defend it. But of course, as we remember, the main argument is that it protects the other people, right? It protects your grandma. The masks don't protect you, it protects everybody else. Okay, that's what they pivoted into once they clearly saw that we were wise to their lies. Well, here's what it says The goal of COVID 19 public health guidance is to shut down this viral transmit system. Good ventilation disperses aerosol clouds. Distancing reduces other people's vulnerability to those particles, by the way, which aerosols, which go through all these masks, by the way. And then it says, 
masks block them from our mouth and noses. Now, I mean, you could argue that that's actually true because anything in front of your face would block droplets, but not aerosolized particles. Of course, see, he goes right after the aerosolized particles in order to make you unconsciously think that it does do that. But how in the world can you say that it block? That, that's the opposite of what they've been saying. And by the, even that is not even actually true because we've shown you the studies that they have done. The NIH study on the National Library of Science very clearly says that 97% gets through cloth which is what they're recommending, which is what they're even saying. If they didn't differentiate which one and most people wearing cloth, then we can say that that's what they're talking about. But even the regular medical mass that said 47% of the time get through. So which one is it, guys? Pick your, your narrative. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Now it says, quote, the truth is that if everybody stopped talking for a month or two, the pandemic would probably die off. Oh, good. So I guess we could all just shut up until the election's over and then we'll all be safe is what they want us to believe. Isn't that self-serving? Now it says the the science the uh, the was he a scientist or a professor that's right the professor his name is Jimenez is not only scientist he's not only the scientist banging drums on the sh uh, shut up island others agree that a little bit of speech policing yep could go a long way to reducing viral transmission see how quickly that turned direction so it came, it went from a professor saying the obvious that if you just talk less, you'll have less opportunity to spread the virus. Now, I didn't think didn't sound like he was actually advocating for not talking, but he was just saying the obvious. As he said, it's not controversial. Less talking produces less possible transmission. Basic. But then when they suddenly go, well, how about this? Others agree. Which ones? Don't. Who cares? Right? Who cares about that? Others that you're supposed to just assume are also scientists and experts agree that a little bit of speech policing. So policing your speech now. Now, of course, that could mean keeping you quiet, but also maybe making sure you don't talk about fake news. You know, policing your speech could go a long way in reducing viral transmission. Now, I find it funny that they talk about a study here. And guess what? The one study they point to actually says right here, our findings indicate that surgical masks can eff efficaciously reduce the emission of influenza particles into the environment in respiratory droplets, but not aerosols. Yep, the, one, the primary par factor of transmission, the aerosolized particulates, it does not stop, which is what we've been saying from the beginning and never said anything otherwise. Never said that any kind of a blockage in front of your face wouldn't stop some of the droplets, except for the fact that the study we told you from the NIH says that those masks don't stop most of the droplets, but who cares about that? The point is that the aerosolized particulates which spread the vast majority of the virus, or the, yeah, the virus, don't st get stopped by these masks, period. And that's what we've been saying from the very beginning. And it's funny that they actually point to that study in here as a reference of why they think that these masks work. I mean, it literally says how surgical face masks can reduce viral spread. Okay, but they that's the point. It just said they don't stop aerosolized vi par particulates, which is how they primarily spread. So just think about how funny it is. I bet you, I bet you this guy has probably not even actually read the study. He probably just was told that was something that would reference. I mean, I don't know. I'm assuming. But at the end of the day, he either knows that and didn't and basically misrepresented it to you or didn't read it and sold you the narrative anyway. Pretty ridiculous. But that, again, is the epitome of mainstream media. It says, here's one solution, library rules for America. Oh, isn't that great? Well, now you have to wear a mask. You might have to wear goggles. You have to quarantine when they tell you to, and you can't talk too loud. It's, now it's going to be against the rules. Well, you talked too many times in a row. You're getting a ticket. Library rules for America. Now, sure, that sounds stupid and crazy. They're never going to do that. How many times have we heard that so far in this pandemic? They're never going to make you wear a mask. They're never going to make you stay at home. They're never going to blah, 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 blah. Well, here we are. They're never going to stop you from speaking out loud. Well, I wouldn't want to believe they would. But why is it any different than any of the other things people said would never happen? Every time you walked into a school, a medical clinic, a drugstore, a barbershop, an office, an airplane, a train, or a government building, it says, you should see a sign that reads, hush for your health. All right, so that wasn't planned or anything or, you know, had ready, you're, you're couched and ready for the article, or make good choices, lower your voices, or keep quiet and carry on. So they're literally showing you what is coming, guys, whether it applies to this or any number of things. Whatever they just randomly come up with, they're going to institute based on mandates and executive orders with no actual accountability and no actual process. Why? Because you're in danger. Couldn't be more clear, guys.
And here is Scott Keyes, who is a the, uh, I'm actually not familiar with the account, looks like founder of Scott's Cheap Flights. <laughs> You know, just, you know, one of the blue checks here. Somebody who's pandering to the <laughs> the bad people of the world. A fantastic article. He called fantastic. He's talking about the mask up and shut up. A fantastic article on how talking quietly or not at all has major benefits in reducing the spread of coronavirus. It also helps explain why, and this is quite interesting, or maybe because it's not really there, it helps explain why airplanes haven't been super spreading locations that many initially feared. Of course, now we're justifying why the things we originally said weren't actually happening. We're making up new reasons why they didn't happen the way we said. Isn't it perfect? All self-serving in its own way. No, maybe it's because they're not actually dangerous and all these false positives aren't actually spreading it and on and on and on. Maybe that's why. Now, obviously, talking less on a plane would have that effect. But realize that there's all kinds of interactions. There are ner- there are people that are sitting right next to each other, breathing. There are people on, there are nurse, or, uh, 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 flight attendants going back and forth, touching things, handing people, handing off. I mean, there's more contact and, tra- and closer con- Look, they keep saying wear masks if and when you can't social distance. So clearly social distancing is more important to them. And yet here you are sitting right next to everybody, handing things and crossing over and talking and using seats that were just, I mean, all over the place. And that is supposed to be good because they had masks on. Yeah, totally makes sense. Or it's because it wasn't really there. I'll let you decide for yourself as always. Oh, I forgot to mention also, yeah, here's another article about why masks are making you more gross and sick in a lot of different ways, right? We already talked about the mask mouth scenario, which is this is kind of the same thing, right? But it's just so, it's like, it's funny that these people are reeling about how they don't cause any health effects, despite the obvious health side effects that they already found in five different studies. But there's also very obvious health effects that are maybe not, maybe not detrimental to your immediate health. But it's very clearly bad health effects from wearing a mask. It's hurting your body in plenty of different ways. Now, it says your mask may be causing candidia. candidia. Now, I think that's actually the same one we talked about before. But I just want to bring it up again. Growth in your mouth. Red bumps around your mouth and cracks in the corners of your lips may mean you have a fungal infection. Right? You know exactly what they said that the cloth mask would do? You know, why not? Why not? Since we're here and we're talking about it, why not bring it up in the exact moment when it's necessary? Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. There it is. Here we are again. The usuals have seen this many times. But the point is, I find it interesting. We're talking about infections. Now, yes, we're, we could talk about things like influenza or COVID-19, but we could, there's also things like fungal infections. Well, now, look, this is what the study found all the way back in 2015, right? That the study for the first random controlled trial of cloth masks, the results caution against the use of cloth masks. This is an important finding to inform occupational health. Moisture retention, reuse of cloth masks, and poor filtration may result in increased risk of infection. It says right here, higher in cloth masks, meaning that's influenza-like illness like COVID-19. So that's exact. They knew this would happen. They knew that in, they're, right now the CDC is still recommending cloth masks to the vast majority. Things like bandanas. Okay, and yet here it is. They knew it would cause things like more influenza or possibly even more COVID-19. And here it is where it's being proved right, right in real time. Your people are getting fungal infections on their mouth because they're wearing these masks. But that doesn't help you should you... (laughs) Gosh, this is so stupid. So let me read it again. Red bumps around your mouth and cracks in the corners of your mouth. May mean you have a fungal infection, but that doesn't mean you should stop wearing a mask. (laughs) The gospel of masks, guys, doesn't matter. You're, you start to lose your eyesight, don't worry. Keep wearing the mask because you're going to die if you don't wear it. It says, if a mask, mask knee, oh God, it's so stupid. Now there's even a term for acne caused by the mask. If a mask knee, like ma- mask acne weren't bad enough, there's another skin problem to worry about during COVID-19. The, the candida overgrowth is basically a yeast infection around your mouth. Yeah, that sounds great. Right? So we're all getting acne and breath problems and yeast infections and viral fungal infections in our masks and our mouths and yeah, good times. I'm sure that's going to be a huge boon for Big Pharma and some other groups that are probably already making lotions and, and, you know, botanicals and all kinds of stuff just for that problem. Now it says there are things you can do if you suspect this is what's going on in your skin, but, but not wearing a mask isn't the solution. Of course not. 
The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends the general public wear, guess what, nothing other than a cloth face covering when social distancing is impossible. If you suspect candida growth is at the root of your mouth sores, that sounds lovely, here's what you need to know. So that's not even, it's different things. So now, we all have mask mouth sores, right? We all just know that now. We all have the normal mouth sores we all have. So if you start to have candida growth at the root of your mouth sores, well, here's what you need to do. This is disgusting. Like, this is the most disgusting scenario where we're dealing with all these really gross problems dealt by this, and just because they're grasping on, like, de for dear life, that this is the one thing we need to keep doing to save us all, even though the science is not there, and even though the, even the thing itself they're protecting us from is not there, they're still forcing this in. I mean, it is schizophrenic. That is next level insane. Ah, it's just unbelievable. And gross, and really, really gross. Especially, I'll include this again, the study. And I haven't seen any other studies coming out saying that they're finding the opposite about the cloth mask. So ha tell me why they keep pushing the cloth mask because the CDC, all of them, the Trump administration, the other side of the government, they all know about this study. They know that it's here. They know that they found that cloth masks make you more sick. So why are they recommending them to everybody? No one has dared to answer that question because they, if they address it, then they'll be admitting that they know that this is here. Think about how crazy that is. In every single aspect of this entire thing, every choice they have made has has led very clearly to more problems. But let's keep pretending like that's just incompetence when in reality it's an agenda. Now, here is what's happening when you, you know, don't wear masks. And this is Australia, again, but recognize, or actually I believe it is, this one might actually be the UK. So I, always, I, I don't know why I keep mixing them up, but obviously it matters. But the uh, in this case, He's sitting there without a mask, well away from everybody, right? So he is social distanced, which by default should mean he shouldn't have to wear a mask, right? Except that it's enclosed. I get that. That's their, I'm trying to remember all their nonsensical things. But at the end of the day, he has a medical exemption. He is, say, he, and, and on top of even that, I think this is actually where I got it. I think uh, Breeze, yeah, Anna Breeze says, I'm exempt on the ground that it causes me extreme distress. That's all he needed to say. That, the, that, that is actually a government exemption. But the point is this cop didn't care. The cop didn't care at all because he decided that guy was either lying or whatever. He decided to take it upon himself to remove this man, even though there are exemptions, more than one, and he was verbally stating so. I mean, do you not realize how crazy that is? So even the exemptions they pretend we have are not allowed, according to the new police state. Underline health conditions, you don't have to wear a mask. Underline health conditions. I do not have to wear a mask. I need to End of. And you do not have to challenge me either. It's against the law to challenge me. I'm not going to argue anymore. Yeah, it's against the law to challenge me as well. I'm not getting off. Come on, Devin. Go! Who the fuck's you are that? See, right, and, and heads up, there's going to be some cursing here. Now, how in the world does this police officer think that he has the right to lay hands on that man? I mean, this is not new. We've seen this all over the place. But what, what, at what point did that line break down? Why do they feel obligated to cross that? I mean, first of all, the same point they keep making. How stupid and counterintuitive, counterintuitive is it to claim the man is violating the, man, the rules of social distancing and mask wearing and then literally break those same rules to enforce those rules? I mean, at it, the most basic logic, that is that you, you're doing the same thing. So the cops should be arrested, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. The point is, if his actions are making people unsafe, why do the thing that makes them unsafe? So it ends up being the same problem. And then you're going to take him to a place where he's going to be arrested and put in close proximity with other people? It's it, while people are being released from jail for COVID-19. I mean, it just goes around and around. It's ridiculous. Now, you're watching this thing that the cop's mask even falls down, or I think he pulls it down, and he just leaves it down because he's having trouble breathing. Big surprise. And of course, it's okay for him when he's trying to enforce the thing that he's doing himself. Makes perfect sense. The bottom line is, he has no right, legally, in any way, to physically put hands on a man who is doing nothing, first of all, nothing violent in any sense. So imagine that this is a guy who is, you know, getting a, doing some, a non-violent kind of thing and having the cop's body slam him to the ground. You know, jaywalking and having run just body slam. Like, that's the equivalent. There's no logical escalation here. I mean, the, the, the point is that they feel justified to put people in prison, in jail, 
based on these new mandates. And that is clearly coming from somewhere. That is, their heads are filled with this. They are being told this is okay because they wouldn't do this as, 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 as clearly ubiquitous as it's happening. It's everywhere if they thought they would be held accountable for it. Who the fuck do you think you're grabbing? Hey, who are you grabbing? Who the fuck are you grabbing? Get off me! I told you, no! Now get off me! Now get off me! Now you've been told. Get the fuck off. Hey! Who the fuck are you grabbing there? I'll spray you, mate. What? You're not spraying me for nothing. And see what he said? He's restraining him, right? So how do you attack a man and then claim that you have to restrain him after he responds to your attack? That is that is preemptive self-defense. That is Palestinian rockets. That is rockets in Iraq. That is the same nonsensical, mindless state of, of insta in instigating violence and then pretending you're defending yourself. I'm telling you they get trained to do so. Wrong. He hasn't done nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong. Medical conditions. I mean, even everyone around him is screaming that they have an exemption, and nobody cares. I mean, you know, personally, I'm not advocating that people throw themselves into this kind of violent situation. But I'll tell you right now, if I was on that train, I would have 100% stood behind that man. There is no way you have a right to do this. There are ways, and you know, Derek Rose talks about this a lot. There are ways of non-violently de-escalating even police officers. Of course, they're still going to tackle you and throw you to the ground and arrest you. You know, the point is, hopefully, mass resistance, non-violent resistance, could do something. Right? That's not jumping in and grabbing the police officer and throwing him down. Like, try to get in between it. Try to stop it. Right? While speaking. I mean, you know, look, I'm not telling you what to do. You do whatever you think is right. My opinion is there are ways you can handle this. And I'm, it, again, I w would accept also being arrested for that same problem. Hopefully other people would step in and do the same. Because what this cop is doing is wrong. And it's been shown in more times than I can count precedents that you have a right to stop this if the cop is... The law applies to everybody. We seem to forget that today. So when a cop is by breaking the law and no one's there to stop it, you have an obligation and a right as a citizen to do something about it. The problem is that police officers today don't think like that. And they want to hold they want to be vindictive, right? And do something against you for daring to challenge their authority. And that is because of the way the government and everybody else at the top has made this situation develop. Right? This this isn't an incident a coincidence. We're here for a reason. I need to speak to you. I'll speak. Get up. Why are you to and he's he's hitting him. Meanwhile, he's holding this thing where he's about to spray, but he's aiming about everybody else around the train. Watch. You're pointing at me. Not even pointing at him. Yeah. But bring you on the one that be I've got every bit of this. Get off me now. Mate, mate, you've done nothing wrong. Oh, you've done nothing wrong. You're on a power trip here. Yeah. yeah. I've got to get You're on a power trip. Yeah. And I've heard you spoke to you and told you why I don't have to fucking care. Uh, what? Let go of me. I'm fucking scared. You. you let go of me. Let go of me. Get off him, man. You're the one, you're you're the one on him. Let go of me. He's just bullying. You're the one. You're a bully. You're a fucking bully. I told you I don't have to fucking wear one. I mean, I mean, is, is he really about to spray pepper spray in the middle of a crowded train? I mean, crying out loud. These people are off the rails. Get the fuck off me. Hey, what the fuck's he doing? Get the fuck off me. No, I've been fucking told. Get the fuck off me. What's your name and number, bro? Wow, you see? Okay, that's one. I wanted to make sure I had the next part. You're the one, you're the one on him. You let go of it. You're the one on him, bully. You're the fucking dozen ass. What's it? What's it? What's your name and number, bro? Wow, you see? Whoa! Whoa! Over here, sir. I'll get him into me. You're bang out of order. He's bang out of order. So now his mask has been down, by the way. I forgot to mention it. For the, like most of this time, his mask is well down by his chin. Oh, mate, chill out. The police officer, obviously. It's him. It's the. You let go of it. Anyway, so. 
I again apologize for the cursing. I don't usually play, but it's important for everyone to see this stuff. This is definitely a family friendly show. I, I make a point to not try not to include things that are cursing, but you know, cursing happens in the world. So it's not something we should always be completely shielded from. There are realities, right? But the point is, that's not always going to be there. But it's incredible that this is that this is what's happening. I mean, if you can't see how how incredibly off, unjustified, all of this is. I mean, even if you believe what they're saying is happening, this is so far past what they're allowed to be doing. We're in a state of, in a very alarming state of authoritarian rise. And it's happening in all these Western countries that have been screaming about freedom and democracy up until they had the clearest opportunity to take what they claimed everybody else was doing. That's called being a really disgusting hypocrite. Or at the very least, they never even cared about the things they've been pretending to care about up until this moment when they could take control. I mean, it's just, you know, it's exactly what we're seeing, guys, in every one of these places. Here's another one that is really crazy. This is, this is the kind of thing, like imagine this happens at your home. And I'll, I'll tell you right now to set the stage for this, this is another Facebook post. This is another person who is posting something on Facebook about, you know, whatever, which is their right, by the way. You can go on Facebook and say, none of this is real. I should go, we should be protesting every single day. They don't have any right to come out and tell him that he can't post things like that. And here they are. And not only that, watch what they do. Yeah, I've just gotten up. What, what? Give me a minute. Well, what, what is this in regards to? What's it in regards to? You haven't told me anything. Incitement. Incitement for what? You know you've been your colleagues on the online or not. I told them not to go. Did you incite your colleagues online or not, he says. Go to the protest. He says, I told them not to go to the protest, which seems to be the opposite of what they're saying he did, but doesn't matter to them. Yeah, well, I'm telling you right now. I can speak to you right now. Why do you want me to open the door? I'm speaking to you guys right now. Why? Open the door or we're going to have to break it for posting something on Facebook. Can you not see what's happening, people? I mean, for I mean, look, we've had people posting stuff on Facebook that was inc like, I mean, think about the stuff that people have been trying to get off Facebook, right? I mean, right this moment, we've got things on YouTube. We've got ISIS members and pedophilia and horrible things that you can find right now on YouTube while they're censoring things like Robert Inlakesh's new documentary about Israel, which, by the way, I mean, have, well, the interview will be coming very soon. We'll be talking next on Monday. That's happening. His documentary is being censored. Meanwhile, you can look up on YouTube right this moment and find very disgusting videos about pedophilia stuff. You can find ISIS promoting videos right now. And yet they're telling people that you can't post things discussing your rights on Facebook. And the most disgusting part about all of this is that there are people out there who are saying yes. Yeah, Ryan, these people are putting us in danger. Right, so you can't consider, your, ask yourself, why is it that they can react so immediately with things like this, but they, both Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these things, you can find disgusting violations of the things they pretend to care about right now. But yet they'll happily respond to ambiguous political statements that are misinterpreted and censor it before they can breathe. We need to see what's really happening as they about to break this man's door down for speaking about a protest against something that we should all see is unjust. Well, well, just explain what you're doing first, and then perhaps I'll comply easily. But you're just yelling, you've you got people everywhere. Explain, explain, just talk to me properly. Like, what, what is going on? You've just rocked up with force, got no idea, like early in the morning. Can you just explain, and then I will open the door? What, what 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 what's it to do with? Yeah, hold hold on. What's it to do with though? What have I done? That you didn't tell. Now, do, you, do you realize that they have an obligation, right? I mean, they said incitement, but this man is engaging with them, and all they they just want compliance, guys. That's what this is. They want compliance. Do what you're told. And they're immediately infuriated that you're not respecting their authority. How dare you not open your door for us? Right? You can just see it. And this is what it comes to. The point is that he's engaging. He's saying, explain why you're here and I'll open the door for you. They don't want it. They want it on their terms. Oh, man. Wait. Look, here comes yeah, the guy wait, with the door ramp. for what? What, what? what are you suspecting me of doing? He said he's going to come downstairs. He's not, so... 
Yeah, to do with what? No, if you, if you do that, I will charge every single one of you. I'll take you to court and you're going to lose. Look, look at that no trespassing sign, yeah? There's seven court case precedents from the Supreme and High Courts of Australia. Yeah, because I'm trying to talk to you first. You're not telling me what you're doing. Yeah, what's a search warrant for what? what? What gives you the authority to have a search warrant? Well, you do that. You know what? Wow. Leave my shit. Don't break my stuff, you fucking retard. Right, and of course, as usual, when you don't do exactly what you're told, of course, they're going to be real clumsy when they're breaking in. They're going to accidentally knock your TV over and accidentally steal your money, like which happens every damn time. When you watch them, when you get when you get uh, police officers caught when they're you know raiding a dispensary and they start eating the the, the very cannabis treats that they're t- pretending they're protecting you from. I've shown you a thousand videos like that. These people are damn hypocrites, and it drives me up the wall. Here they are breaking into this guy's house based on a Facebook post about his rights. Hey, stop breaking my shit! Leave my shit! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hey, alright, stop! Stop! And of course, was he being violent? No, he wasn't. But yet they attack him, right? They run up and they violently throw him to the ground. Right? There is standard operating procedure, right? I mean, the whole point is that when they're like, this is the equivalent of having a SWAT team kick your door down for a drug charge or for something that's totally even more so nonviolent, which happens all the time. It just cre- creates the possibility for people to get shot, which is why they call it swatting somebody. When you pretend, when you lie about him and say, hey, he's got a gun and the SWAT kicks in their door and causes violence and goes, oh, oops, we blindly took some anonymous call. Our bad. And that's the world we live in, guys. That's that is the world we're living in at this moment. Whether it's Australia or the well, that and that was, or whether it's UK or whether it's the United States, this is the reality. All these people that have been screaming about freedom and democracy are the very people that are actually rolling in the authoritarian rule. What a surprise. Oh, and did I forget to tell you that there's no new cases in Queensland? No new cases. No, no new cases at all. Not deaths, gone. Not even cases. And yet they're doing that to that person right there for posting a Facebook post about protesting absolutely unrealistic authoritarian lockdowns based on no new cases. And he's the one being arrested. Oh, and did I forget to tell you, when there's no new cases, here she is saying, of course, we know that they're still not out of the woods yet, though. But I'm, but I'm pleased that we've gotten zero cases today. So if zero is not out of the woods, what exactly is? I guess we just have to wait and for them to tell us that we're safe. Hopefully you get the point. And just like that, it's not just the UK or, the, or Australia. It's everywhere. Utah students and staff who don't wear masks in schools can now be charged with a misdemeanor. It is actually becoming a crime to not wear a mask. Oh, like the very, oh, they're never going to do that. Here we are again. Big surprise. And of course, their big caveat in the article is that students and staff in Utah who don't wear a mask in K through 12, K through 12 kindergartners, in accordance with the governor's mandate, can be charged with a misdemeanor. A kindergartner can be charged with a misdemeanor. And of course, the whole premise is that, well, we're not going to do that, though. Well, then why did you make it possible? Why would you even make it possible? if it, Why not? I mean, think about how stupid that is. What they say is it's enforcement enforced on a district and superintendent level. But we're not thinking, let's slap a bunch of kids with misdemeanors. But then we made sure we could slap a bunch of kids with misdemeanors, though, just in case. <laughs> like, it's just... Like, how can you literally write it out and make it happen and say this is the reality and then write an entire article about how it won't apply to the very people that you just said it can apply to? This is the kind of schizophrenic nonsense that we're dealing with today. As she wears the face shield that does absolutely nothing that we just found out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's stupid. But the point, 
is that they're actually trying to convince you that they just set up a scenario for their schools to charge anyone with because and this is K through 12. Obviously it's going to apply to the high the you know high schoolers, right? You're going to get the kids in in high school that are going to essentially be, you know, challenging this and they're absolutely going to charge them with the misdemeanor if they're a kid that won't listen. But that's why well, we're not going to we're not we're not thinking let's just slap a bunch of kids with misdemeanors, but we're very clearly thinking let's slap that one kid that won't listen. Yep, that's what they're thinking, and that's why they're doing this. Of course, you know you know as a guarantee that the administrators and the people that work there are wearing masks. Why? Because they're told they have to. That's a guaranteed fact. So they're not trying to enforce this on them. They're trying to enforce it on the kids. They're trying to brainwash a new generation into doing what they're told. And this is the disgusting reality. Is they're now actually man they're making it illegal to do things that they don't want you to do. And it's not even going through legislation. This isn't even going through voting. You're not deciding this. They are, based on an administrative mandate or an executive order. That's the world we're in. And they're telling you it's pro it's temporary, but while giving you every single indication that there's a thousand reasons why it will go on forever. Just like the war on terror or the war on drugs or the war on this or the war on that or the war on everything that will never come to an end because they're made that way. But I also wanted to point out that you will see some pushback on this. It depends on how much we see and how courageous people are about it. But here's from ProPublica. He faced a criminal charge for not self-isolating when he had COVID-19 symptoms. Prosecutors just dropped the case. You know why? Because it's unjust. And because we're finding out that there actually is no legal ground. Because when you start to find out how flimsy these tests are, and you start to find out how so the science on the mask is really laid out, and why the box of masks says they can't protect you, and so on and so on, a lawyer will very quickly realize, okay, this is some dangerous ground. We can't actually charge this because it will get overturned. So they drop the case. You need to see these clues. But that doesn't mean they're going to stop doing it. But th the, that there's, it's hard for them to get past that. Now, what it says, and here's the actual document, prosecutors have dismissed a criminal charge against a man who was accused of endangering public safety. He was ordered to self-isolate because he had some symptoms, which, you know, might not have been anything at all. Now, I believe we might have even talked about this individual, Little, I think. He had the chest pains, and they thought that the chest pains were enough to just deem that he was sick, despite having negative tests as well. That might not be this exact same case, but the name seemed familiar. But it says, Little had stopped at the gas station convenience store in St. Maine in Jasper County so his four-year-old could use the bathroom. A store employee, and this also speaks to, you know, see something, say something, you know, the snitch, ta the tattletale country that we're desi they're designing around us, tattletaling on your friends and your, every, you know, people you see in your community, even based on this one, it turns out that he's not actually a problem, right? But it's the store employee attended high school with him Recall the Facebook post of Little where he shared a note from prof medical professionals saying that he had to stay home. Once Little left the convenience store where he was letting his four-year-old pee, the employee and the supervisor, the su they decided to call the authorities. Jasper County's state attorney's office then charged Little with reckless conduct and a misdemeanor for not doing what he was told. Now, once, and it says that the charge was dropped on Thursday, according to the Jasper County Circuit Clerk's office. In March, Little told ProPublica uh, Pro Illinois that he had experienced chest pains, a symptom consistent with the novel coronavirus or consistent with, you know, 80% of the problems, you know, damn, a thousand other things that it could be, including, you know, just being old, which prompted him to go to a respiratory clinic, though he was not tested for the virus. What? Right, so he's not he's thinking how crazy that is. Why in the world? And this is at, this is in March, and I can tell you why. That was at a time when they were still trying to just kind of they weren't really they were resisting a little bit. But nonetheless, he wasn't even tested. The satellite TV installer was told that he could not work and that he must self isolate, which for most people is a death sentence. It says by the end of March, and I mean in regard to like your your finances and everything, right? He's got a job, he's got a family. No, it says, by the end of March, there was no report of coronavirus cases or deaths in that county. <laughs> so nothing's going on. And in neighboring Richland County, where Little lives, nothing. As of August 27th, Jasper County has reported 104 positive ca cases, seven, which, by the way, we know 90% of that could be false positives, and seven deaths. Only seven deaths. And Richmond County has reported 58 cases in one death. That's it. This entire time. I mean, that is absurd. And yet they were, at, and this, that's why it was dropped. It says, at the time Little was cited, the case was thought to be the first of its kind. At least one more case has emerged since then. 
This month, Richland County prosecutors charged a woman with reckless conduct after she reportedly tested positive for the coronavirus and allegedly violated the state home order. Now, you could just see where this is going. Based on tests that are shown to be in wildly inaccurate, you cannot force people to do anything. Period. And yet, here we are. But we are seeing the legal system start to kind of balk at the charges, dropping the case. Now, why would that be? Right? If this guy did the obvious and broke the rule, why would they drop the case? It's because they can see that there's not legal standing for the charge. We're going to see more of that, believe me. But what they're hoping for is that you get scared and just do what you're told anyway. So then they don't have to bring it to court. Then they don't have to have these things. But there's a lot of this happening right now. I just saw one a woman laying down. She was serving the whole city council serving them all with papers saying that they're doing is illegal. They don't have the right to do these mandates. And it was awesome. And I'm hopefully we're going to see a lot more of that. Now, one more point that I wanted to include before foreign policy, which is something that Brian recently shared with me, was really unnerving. Now, I'm going to wait to see how this develops before we report more on this. But I really thought this was something you should be made aware of, especially because of what this has to do with. As Brian tweeted out, y'all better wake up now. Ohio to use FEMA camps to quarantine those who show symptoms or test positive. And here's the absolute, there's the link to it on the actual doc. This is on Ohio.gov. Okay. It says Department of Health, Ohio. Lance Himes, the Department of Health, pursuant to the authority granted to me and and so on and so on, require reports and make inspections and investigations that the director considers necessary. All right. So right there, you understand that they get the, they are saying we have the right to do, to do Direct these investigations as we consider necessary, which is just whatever they want to do. Make special orders for preventing the spread of contagious contagious or infectious diseases. Investigate or make inquiry into the cause of illness or disease, including contagious, infectious, epidemic, pandemic, or epidemic conditions. And take, why isn't this highlighting? That's weird. Well, let me highlight it. Anyway, I'm right here on the first paragraph. Just lost my spot. And to take prompt action to control and suppress it. Right there. Okay, that is a blanket statement to do whatever at any time if it's deemed necessary to stop and control the spread. Now, the point is, it then goes on to state that they're making shelters. Guess what? They're signing a deal with FEMA. FEMA camps. Where have we heard that before? FEMA enters into a FEMA state agreement applicable to this entire state of Ohio and authorizing applicants to apply for emergency protective measures, including non-congregate sheltering. Now, that's, of course, people can say, hey, I have nowhere to go. But it also goes on to point out the reality that there are people that have nowhere else to go. So it's that that's a very clear assumption that then it's no longer your choice, right? If you have, the, the point is, these are people who are sick. And what they're saying is, if you're sick, you need to self-isolate. That is a That is not your choice. Okay, so if you then have nowhere to self-isolate, do the math. Your place will be at the FEMA camp. And that's what this then says. They're saying that, pe- that if the, for this is for people that don't have a location. But so then it's they very carefully leave off that that's not your choice. But that's clear in all the other mandates they make about self-isolation for the COVID-19. Right, you see what they're doing? So they know that. And so now, I mean, I just had to include this for you for all the people out there that have been discussing the concept of FEMA camps, you know, conspiracy theorists. And here is yet another gigantic uh, theory about people conspiring that ties right in with the coronavirus 19 agenda. Is it not incredible that they're now creating FEMA camps that are, (laughs) that's, that's, I've heard that so many times since even before I started doing this. And here we are in the same exact scenario. And yet again, it's this whole thing. And every one of these things are converging together. So we'll see how this plays out. But this is a direct, this is a, I guess, like sort of executive order, a, a direct, a director's order from the Department of Health saying that we're creating FEMA camps in an agreement with FEMA to use these shelters statewide. Take all necessary actions, it says, to identify both public and private facilities, secure available space, enter into contracts and mutual agreements. It's exactly what people have been concerned about from the very from for a long time. So thank you, Ryan, for pointing this out. But this is where these are going, and this is what is. Per- I mean, ask yourself why they didn't do this the first time around. Why do they do this only now for the planned pandemic too? Because we're in the middle of a real world exercise, and they are playing this out. And that doesn't necessarily mean this isn't real. 
It, there's, there's not a real threat, but it means that this is something that has so clearly been planned or so clearly been guided since it began that it, it's just impossible to ignore. And of course, I wanted to add something that I saw on Jimmy Dore's show, breaking a federal appeals court just ruled that the, the NSA's bulk collection of Americans' phone records was illegal. Oh, really? Oh, so good. I'm so glad they finally ruled the thing we've always known from the moment this started. This ruling, which confirms what we've always known is a victory for our privacy rights. Yeah, it's a real big victory decades later for the ACL to rule something that's already happening that's not going to stop now because there's a thousand other reasons. All their ruling is, I'm not saying it's bad they did this. I'm just saying what a moot kind of meaningless ruling. We know that that's happened. I mean, not only did they get caught over and over and over, not only did they pretend it wasn't happening and Clapper lies and should have been put in prison for lying on in front of Congress, we then find out that it was happening because of Ever Snowden, and then we all knew as a matter of fact that it was illegal. Right that moment, we didn't need some federal court to be like, oh, we, uh, we researched that obvious thing and we've decided that it is illegal years and years and years later. I mean, I don't even, I don't even, I feel like this almost angers me. Like, I feel like this is almost like, a, it's it's almost a manip, like, did anybody think it was legal? I mean, it was, it was admitted, it was shown, it went forward. Then they said we weren't doing it after it was admitted. Then they started doing it again. Then they pretended it stopped again. And now we're at a point where it's actually been reinforced in a thousand different ways why we need to do it. And now they come out and be like, oh yeah, that thing was illegal. But now it's ubiquitous, so who cares? The point in showing you that, guys, is to think about things like what Dr. Fauci said in the beginning when we were asking about, you know, he's talking about conspiracy theories, and he goes, let's just put those aside until this is done, and then we can look at them then. You know why he said that? Because that's what they desperately need you to do, is just put it aside, right? Just wait until they get all their things in place, and the agenda's all put in, it's all controlled and all reinforced, and then you can realize that it was all a big ploy, because it won't matter then. That's the point. And things like this, that's why it bothers me. Because if we're talking about something that happened in what, 2014 or I forget the exact date. It's, you know, it's seven years later. And here we are. I think I said a decade, but whatever. Seven years later. And they're telling us this thing that we should already know. And what happens? Did they stop doing it? No. The NSA, the FBI, our government are willingly, happily overtly spying on you right now. So should we take Fauci's advice? Should we just put it aside and wait until this is over so we can find out seven years later that we find out this is all fake, but too bad we're already there? Well, that's what they want. So learn from this, people. Learn from what you're seeing here. That we knew then it was fake and lies and illegal, and they lie. They then they called us conspiracy theorists. Then they said we were fake news. Then they said we were fighting against. We were anti-America, and now we find out that was all rhetoric and lies from people who knew they were lying. And most of them are still currently involved in the government right now. Let that sink in. But we're all conspiracy theorists, and I'm a big, you know, anti-government, anti-American, anti-mask, anti-vax conspiracy theorist, whatever they want to call us these days. All because people are afraid to look into it for themselves. Now let's finish off with some foreign policy. They won't take very long. I wanted to run through this really quickly. The French press agency, one of the many main outlets where all mainstream media news flows from. So there's no point in watching Fox or CNN because all you're getting is their spin on the news. You should actually just find the things that I get and the direct notifications of what's going on. Or, you know, watch this show. It's up to you. But update. U.S. economic sanctions against top international criminal court prosecutor. You know, when Pompeo blustered and said they were um, sanctioning the, 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 the ICC officials. Well... Another senior official, it says U.S. economic sanctions against those people are coercive acts that attack the international criminal justice and the rule of law more generally, according to the ICC. Of course, well, they're going to say, well, ICC is defunct and not rule. The point is, this is what, the, this is the fact. This is the reality of international law. Now, I'm not saying that we should blindly trust the ICC either. But the ICC has been put in place for the very purpose of holding criminal government officials accountable like Pompeo. Not American people, 
not the, I mean, I don't, as far as I understand it, this isn't even applying, this, this is about the people who are not being held accountable who committed crimes, not holding the government, you know, at large accountable or the entire country accountable. This is fine tuning it down to the people who are skating by. That's how I've seen it in the past. And that's the reality we're dealing with right now. And that's why they're so afraid of this because they have committed lots of crimes. And there are a lot of people in our government that are very clearly guilty, but they don't want you looking into it. So they attack them. But here is a fantastic article that I'm only going to go over a good portion of it, but not the whole thing. I hope you'll read its entirety. Alfred Desaius, I hope you remember, we had I had on the show on May 6th in regard to, uh, I believe this was in regard to Venezuela, in regard to the coup, and the the basically him basically him calling this out as a UN rapporteur on tour uh, uh, on human rights. He is absolutely he's stepping up and saying this is unjust. What they're doing is criminal. What they're doing is killing people with those sanctions, and it is illegal. It's a great interview. I hope you watch it for yourself. But that I, this is an article he actually wrote in 2019, and this is fun. I've been arguing not arguing, I've been stating for quite a long time now that unilateral sanctions from the United States are illegal. Even to the argument of people that support me, ah, it's not true, Ryan, you can't say they're illegal. They are illegal. And I've made the point before, I actually went over partially, part, some part of this, not this article, but the same point, showing you that it was very clearly illegal at every sense of the word. But this, I mean, just think of it like this. As always, there should never be one person that you blindly trust and just ignore everybody else. But this is the person you should be listening to. Do your due diligence, research it for yourself, find other opinions, but this is the expert. I mean, this is this guy is a this guy is a leading expert on human rights and international law and is right now, I mean, the guy right now It's so interesting to me how people like this like okay, if this guy stood up today and said Venezuela is the mo is the most despotic country and we need to overthrow them and they're murdering people and starving everybody, Alfred Desaias would be the darling of the media, right? Alfred Desaias would be the full full focus of the U.S. government. But because he doesn't, and he says the opposite, they pretend like he doesn't exist. Sort of when you think of people like Mills Nelsner, who is also trying to fight for Julian Assange and acts are committing. Oh, who cares? Why don't we just ignore it entirely? even though they're literally mandated, they, they're obligated to respond because of the charter of the UN and they just don't care because they're illegal. Everything they do is illegal. They do not care about what they hold everybody else accountable to. And I'm talking about the governments, the very governments we're always pointing at. Now it says in this great article, the question arises whether in the light of the UN charter, unilateral coercive measures like US sanctions could be considered compatible with modern international law. Right? So could these unilateral sanctions even be considered compatible? The orthodox answers uh, that only answer is that only those sanctions that are imposed by the Security Council under Chapter 6 of the consider is, are considered legal, which is what I've always been saying. Only the, only the sanctions imposed by the Council, by Security Council, are legal. Article 41 of the Charter stipulates the charter that they're all a part of, yet all the, the good guys eagerly ignore the moment that it benefits them. It stipulates the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to the decisions. But even Security Council decisions and resolutions must be compatible with the purposes and principles enunciated in Articles 1, 2, 55, and 56 of the UN Charter and not violate fundamental norms of international law, customary international law, or treaties such as the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which stipulate right to life and right to health and right to medical care. And the point, this is the same kind of point we made before, that... You just because like, this is like saying, look, they're doing a bad thing so we can step in and do a bad thing to stop their bad thing. And that makes it okay. Right. Not only is that contradictory and hypocritical of the person talking about ultra doing the right thing and being the leading shining beacon of freedom and then justifying murder because they murder. Right. That's just dumb. But that's the point. What he's saying is that you don't, the idea is that once these actions become, it's sort of the idea of things being repugnant to the constitution. Once they're repugnant to the constitution, they're null and void. Same point. The moment that these things go, are, they violate the fundamental norms of international law and the charters he laid out, they immediately become illegal. 
Now it says the 1993 Vienna Declaration of, and Program of Action, which called upon states to refrain from unilateral measures that create obstacles to trade relations among states and impedes the full realization of the human rights set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Like these are the, the th very principles that Pompeo so grossly pretends to embody as they're literally violating these things. That's why people like Alfred Desaius will go on my show because they won't give him time to speak anywhere else. And this is the expert on these things. And he's literally telling us that these people are violating all of this stuff. Nothing is sacred to them. It actually states to refrain from unilateral measures that create obstacles to trade. And they are actively taking measures to explicitly block trade and starve and attack food and water infrastructure. Like that, that is terrorism. It says the Security Council is not above international law um, it, and as its mandate is circumscribed by Article 24 of the Charter. And to be clear, by the way, in no way is this meant to just argue that the UN should have any kind of control or any of this stuff, right? This is the point, is these things are separate. But nonetheless, when there are people who aren't, the, the idea is the same point. Is that, that what's happening is the United States government are the ones that are, they are the ones overstepping themselves. They are the ones going above and beyond and doing things that put other people at risk. So what they're saying here is not saying you're now going to be put in jail. What they're saying is that they're saying you need to follow the charters that we all agreed on. It is yet another contract that we talked about earlier that is being ignored. Which is simply exactly what the CDC is now doing with our rental agreements. Like they're just violating. It. No, nothing is sacred. Might is right. If you're powerful enough, you take it. And that's what we're being taught today. It says, thus the imposition of sanction regimes that are tantamount to collective punishment and cause widespread death and suffering on innocent people are contrary to Article 24 of the... Con yeah, I mean, obviously, you're murdering people. But the point is collective punishment, such as the actions being taken by the Israeli government, actions being taken by the United States government, actions being taken by the Saudi Arabian government. We are collectively punishing entire populations of innocent people. And it's all okay because broad bad guy, because Palestine bad guy, because Yemen bad guy... That is where we are. And this is the expert telling you that your governments are criminals and that they're all trying to say it and we don't want to listen because we have been taught that, that you know, the, the countering idea. If you even suggest that this is the case, well, then you're arguing for global governance. And that's the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Nobody is even coming close in my side of this argument to arguing, and I just mean me and, you know, people on who supporters of us are arguing that we should then allow the UN to step in and control and do this. And it should be the American people, period. But if we are in a position where our own leaders are refusing to do what, the, what we're actually voting them to do or what we're actually asking them to do, where else do we turn? You, the point is the same way. That it, in the case you could have someone like Donald Trump telling the state that you can't do these unconstitutional actions. You can't do that about the mass or do this about this or that. And I have a right as the president to tell you to stop, but I don't have a right to then step in and rule that state. The point is he then tells them to stop the unconstitutional actions, make sure it gets enforced, and then backs away and allows the people of the state to continue to rule themselves, which is the illusion we tell ourselves we live in. Same thing applies here. The point is people like, I mean, whether you, I mean, it's, it, there's so much aggressive two-party politicization happening right now. Just to, when you just say Trump or somebody, people immediately take a side, but just, you know, taking a, to, to any, the president of this country or the state, the department, the, uh, the secretary of state or the secretary of defense or whoever they are. If there's an entity, like think of it when Clinton was in that position, who is very clearly doing things that are even extrajudicial, like outside, not even working with the other parts of the government you know, using their foundations to do things with the government position all around the world. That is something where, especially when our own government won't hold her accountable, that in groups like the ICC will step in and say, you're a criminal. Hold her accountable. Hopefully put her in jail. And then the American people decide who should fill the position. Right? That's very clear. But of course, everything else is being manipulated into something else because the last thing they want is for us to actually recognize that our entire government is so incredibly rogue and all complicit with these incredibly illegal actions and all profiting wildly and living cushy lives during this whole thing. Because the moment you realize that, it all crumbles. If we realize it from both sides of our false paradigm. Now it says no, no, uh, nothing in the UN Charter can be read 
as authorizing in any way unilateral coercive measures like all the things the U.S. government are doing right now, which are incompatible with general principles of international law, right? The very thing that Pompeo pretends he's trying to fight for, international law, violate the prohibition of interference in the international affairs of other states and violate their sovereignty, right? Exactly. How can you pretend like you're not violating Bolivia's sovereignty or not violating Venezuela's sovereignty or not violating Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or on and on and on? You can't. The only re a way that they say they're, protect they're not doing that is because they claim that the people of those countries want that guy gone, which is just not true. Or that they that guy did bad things, and so we need to go in and do bad things. And that's where that point comes in. And so the problem arises when numerous powerful states become rogue states, deliberately ignoring their erga omnis. I think that's all for one obligations are kind of like, you know, helping everybody obligations and breach international law and do it with impunity, which is what we're staring at. But here's the thing. It says the very concept of rule, of rule of law rejects the proposition that a violation of norm invalidates the norm. Which is, the, which is like the go-to gospel of the U.S. government and Israel and everybody else. But they say, well, you know, like that's the preemptive self-defense, right? You are claiming that because they're bad guy or they're about to do bad thing or because they do bad thing, that then we can take an action that is fundamentally illegal with everything we talk about, that is counter to our principles, that is opposite of our morals. But sure, because they are bad guy, then it makes us good guy, even if we do bad thing. Like, it's just so stupid. And here he is as an expert, straight up telling you the very concept of rule of law rejects the proposition of a violation of norm invalidates the norm. You don't get to go murder J Soleimani because you claim they're about to do bad things. You just broke the law. You need to go to jail. It doesn't matter if you claim they're breaking the law or he's about to break the law. It doesn't change anything except the fact that you broke the law. Right? And if they did too, then everyone needs to be like, you don't just get to invalidate that crime because they're committing crimes or you say they're committing crimes. That is literally everything we're dealing with in an incredible scope right now. Now it says the situation is different. A breach of international law occurs, which for the time being cannot be reversed in the absence of an effective enforcement mechanism. Right? So whether we're talking about the breach of somebody else and all they do is continue to breach international law under the guise that they're trying to keep them in line. Or the actual breach is the international, like the sanctions and so on. And there's no mechanism to stop them from doing so. So it just carries on. And we sit in this, in this paradox of law where it's not actually being enforced. All they're doing is enforcing violence under the guise of law. Now it says there are many historical precedents. Apartheid was incompatible with international law. Human, uh, incompatible with international law, human rights law, adver uh, adver uh, advisory opinions of the International Court of Justice, resolutions of the Security Council, and yet it persisted for decades. Why? Right? They're talking about Africa, obviously, but the same thing's happening in Israel. It's obviously incompatible with international law, but here it is marching forward because there are criminals that are making this continue. But his point is just because it's happening and just because people are part of this charter does not make it legal. In fact, the opposite. I would argue they're held to a higher standard or should be sort of the illusion we lie about our police. You know, they should be. I mean, the idea is that the, if you're in an official position, you should be 10 times more accountable. But it's the exact opposite. People in official positions today, police and whatever else, pretend like they're somehow, you know, immune from accountability because they put their lives on the line. Doesn't that sound exactly like what's happening with COVID-19? It's the same thing. Vaccine, we can't, we can't hold them accountable for the safety because they're doing it for you, even though we don't want it. At all, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that all these things tie together. We are living this reality, guys. Now, just as a note, since we're speaking about Israel, Here's, here's something that may ring a little true with a lot of people that are, you know, still thinking about George Floyd and stuff like that. Here's an Israeli soldier filmed kneeling on an elderly Palestinian's neck in the West Bank. Why? Because he was protesting. Doesn't that seem sort of relevant to what we were just talking about? <laughs> and don't you love how they just fire a random shot, right? That happens all the time. It's, it's just a scare tactic. 
You're you're firing open shots around unarmed protesters to get them. I mean, this is the this is the unaccountable reality of these kind of people. And by the way, in many places, yes, it is true that these IDF members, not these, but IDF, does in many places train U.S. police, and that is very clearly showing itself. You know, imagine that's your grandfather, you know, standing up for his rights. Now, one thing I would note is I know it seems, I, so some people that don't see this stuff a lot, it may seem same, sort of like staged almost that there's all these press right there, but that's, this is constant. I mean, this, this is real world, like where there, you see videos and there it is. And then it's just funny. It's, it, it, I wonder where that came from, you know? It's, just, it's disgusting. It's sickening to me that this is the realities people live in. Why? For holding a Palestinian flag. Because it's illegal, right? It's, it's against the law. You're not allowed to have that flag. Now, here's the point. At least, you know, in, the, in regard to the protest and along where they're protesting. But the point... God, it's just, it's just so... It's so unnerving. But you could see this, and it's just so normalized. But the, the in regard to the the, it just bothers me. But in regard to the the, the press, I just it's important to know that that's not there, it, there's it's very common, and even more common you'll find that the IDF will end up attacking the press because they're trying to get pictures, and you know if they're in a certain position they'll get shot. It happens all the time. But there you go. And this is, I mean, what, and, you know, again, as I said, even with that other video the other day, whether or not these, like there's another video that people, oh, that's not even real. And it's like, it happens every day. Every day we see examples of this. And it's, it's like, whether you want to pretend one's not, it happens every damn day. This is the reality of these people. This is their lives. Should they dare stand up and protest? Well, look, what's look, think about what's happening in Australia right now. These people are posting pro Facebook posts about maybe protesting and they're getting their doors kicked in. Get ready to become a Palestinian. Right, that, this is the world that they're putting you into right now. Also, I want to end with the reality that another stash of ammonium nitrate was found, so we're told, in the Beirut port. Now, I, I, the way I'm taking this is I believe this is probably accurate. And the way it seems to me, in my opinion, take it for what you will, I'm basing it off just superficial information, because I, I, I dug quite deep into the first one, and it's my very clearly educated opinion based on the facts around the story that Israel was obviously involved with this. And then it very clearly was not just ammonium nitrate because that's a, that is an, an, a willfully ignorant response when you understand how that actually works. I mean, it's, you could talk to any expert in that field and they will laugh at the, the mainstream media's narrative because it's really that crazy. That a, a, a stray spark from a from a blacksmith landed on this morning nitrate, and it all blew up, and it's just so stupid because that's just so obviously not how it works. But the story was that there, according to uh, especially, especially if you're listening to to people in Lebanon in the Lebanese government, that there were port authorities there that had this there for since what 2014 and didn't tell anybody. And, and the story is very clear about how this happened and how both the Israeli government and the U.S. government were involved at different points in making sure it basically stayed in that port. Very suspicious. And then it weirdly blows up at right at this perfect moment. It happens to be in the most important economic port in all of Lebanon, right after which there's a clear regime change. I mean, it's just so pathetically obvious. But then... Lebanese army discovers another stash of ammonium nitrate at Beirut port a month after deadly explosion. It says with an unsecured warehouse, and by the way, you won't hear anything about this in the media because they got what they wanted out of the first one, right? The, the, as I keep saying, the 9-11 of Lebanon was dropped like a bad habit the moment after it was put away. How insulting is that? So, so their pain and suffering, their, their, their tragedy is not important, but the American government forces this, this remembrance of something that they created on the world every 9-11, which is about to come up. I recommend you check out James Corbett's website because he's got his 9-11 suspects documentary up right now. But think about how insulting that is, right? So their suffering and their massive problem and explosion that I clearly see is tied to the Israeli government is just dropped. It doesn't even matter anymore. 
And yet ours is so pushed in everyone's face. And the reality that our government was so obviously involved with what happened on 9-11 needs to be common knowledge today. And I'm going to focus on it again very, very soon. But it says, Army units operating in the port made the discovery on Thursday. Lebanese media reported. So another huge stash of the very same thing. It says a four-ton stash of ammonium nitrate was found inside a shipping container and was swiftly removed. So you need to ask yourself, was that just put in there? Were they planning to do it again? Was it there and it was meant to be part of the first one and they didn't get to it? I mean, what was it? It's weird, right? I mean, or Lebanon's making it all up. At the end of the day, I find this relevant. Now it says... Customs officials at the port were unaware of its presence. So, you know, according to them, they could be lying. But that that narrative was very clearly supported by the evidence, as far as I'm concerned, in regard to the first one. There was countless examples of outside influence and keeping that where it was. Why would you do that? Obvious, right? And it says the port officials who oversaw its storage and security have been arrested. And this is in regard to the first one we're talking about. And an investigation is ongoing. So, it's interesting. But I think what this shows us is the fact that there's more happening here. And it's so in, it's so insulting that our own that in the entire worldwide mainstream media is so incredibly bought off to the point to where they will ignore anything they're told to. At that level, I mean, think about that level. How many massive million dollar, billion dollar outlets we have that are obviously propaganda, but that that many of them are influenced to the point to where they will actually toe the line crazy well three hours and 24 minutes nah, no big deal <laughs> incredibly long show but i had to get that information out for you so thank you for those of you that stayed tuned today till the end a lot a lot of this is so incredibly important i just can't stress that enough but i did not forget today i made i, I wanted to make sure it ended with jp's recent video that is just so spot on and this is in regard to the new revelation the six percent discussion it's just it's actually fantastic and he says in the video that you should repost this and share it because he wants them to try to have more trouble censoring it so hopefully you'll do the same but i hope that all this information helped people today I hope that, especially the discussion of the thing like the, the World Bank discussion, I hope that opens people's minds to the, the way this is being played and that these things can be relevant, but we shouldn't be so quick to jump on these things, especially when they're that kind of plainly set out for us. But consider them. Keep researching. I might talk about it again in the future. But hopefully all the rest of it is being used. The opening part, I'll make sure I'll make a video about tomorrow. I see that very clearly happening. This is a technocratic control. They are seizing control. And I think pretty quickly, but doing it in a quiet way where nobody's really talking about it. Everything. And I mean, do we really believe that's just going to be handed right back once this goes away? We're smarter than that. But thank you for being here. I love you all. As always. Question everything. Come to your own conclusions. Stay vigilant. As your trusted health authority, I'll share with you why you should be more scared than ever before. But first, there's been a new twist in the COVID crisis. We just published research on the CDC website that shows only 6% of COVID deaths that we've been reporting to you were caused by COVID alone. 94% of COVID deaths had an average of 2.6 comorbidities. That means of the 161,392 COVID deaths that we've been shoving in your face, only 9,210 were legitimate COVID deaths. So does that mean we've been deceiving you and inflating the COVID death count by 152,182 deaths? Absolutely not, because we genuinely don't believe in math. And does this new information that proves that COVID is far less deadly than we've been trying to get you to believe mean you shouldn't live with intense fear anymore? Absolutely not. As your trusted health authorities, we consider our original estimates of over 2 million COVID deaths in the US to be a far more accurate number than the 9,200 deaths that have actually happened. And of the 9,210 deaths, 90% of them were in people of advanced age which means young people are at extreme risk 
because you never know when your age is going to advance by multiple decades all at once. People finding this published information and spreading it around on social media wasn't part of our pandemic because it puts people at risk of not being scared to death of this statistically not very deadly disease. Luckily, we started running smear campaigns on the sources that are highlighting this dangerous fake news that's based on facts. Look for terms like conspiracy theories and fringe theories that we use to make these new statistics irrelevant. And we're also having it censored on social media already for everyone's protection. And to help you further forget this new relevant information, we've also buried it on the CDC website. Good luck finding it. Only 6% of reported COVID deaths actually died from COVID? Now's a great time to discount people that speak of this new information with a well thought out, emotionally charged comment rebutting something they didn't say. Like, Oh, so you're saying you don't even care about the people that did die of COVID? You're glad they're dead? You just want sick people to die? <laughs> well, because they said nothing to indicate that. Your emotionally fueled abstract assumption is obviously a more accurate expression of what they meant than what they expressed. Now we plead with you not to use this new information as a rational basis to rethink the level of fear that you're living under because rethinking your thinking could cause you to change your mind. And changing your mind is uncomfortable and a potential cause of COVID because our science fiction is yet to prove otherwise. And new information is the new outdated information. So you'll wanna stay with the times. So why should you be more scared than ever before? Because statistically speaking, your chances of not dying from COVID are 99.96%. And that means if you're in the 0.04% that does die from COVID, you have a 100% chance of dying. Take a look at the numbers. And luckily that means we're still justified in trying to ruin your lives to save your lives. In an effort to do so, please pay close attention to the COVID death count that will continue to run across your screen for you. Look, here it is. And so you can stay under your warm, wet blanket of fear while we'll neglect to adjust the death count for accuracy with respect to this new information. And we'll also continue to take away your rights for your protection. And just like how a woman abused by your husband might say, he only hits me because he loves me, you can repeat, they're only taking away my rights to protect me. And you'll continue to surrender your rights because you're scared. Now that we've confused any clarity you might've been feeling on the new COVID, go back to sleep. Please stay tuned for more updates on what you should be thinking and feeling.